Good evening, welcome to the April 9th edition of the Dairy Cooperative School Board. So we have our friends from DVS here today, so why don't we let them lead us into the um, Pledge of Allegiance, excuse me. All right, before we get started with the presentation, we have a quick um, approval of minutes from public minutes from March 26th. Can I take a, get a motion for that, please? So moved. First by Jason. Second. Second by Michael. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the motion passes 7-0. All right, let's get started with the presentation, guys. with me tonight, Kimberly Young and Cassia Tessier. I refer to them as my dynamic duo. Um, I've been at Dairyville 60 years, and there's nothing these two women can't do when they put their mind to it. Um, we have an amazing family in our, in our school, and they love to provide them with opportunities that they might not else other, otherwise have an opportunity for. Um, you, met, you throw something on the table, and you see it growing in front of them. They do school store. They, um, Cassia and Kim together raise an amazing amount of money um, with the color run. Uh, we've used organizations in other schools in the past and they take a percentage and each year, the past years I said to them, are you sure you don't want it? Like, isn't it worth it? And they're like, nope, every money that, every penny that can go to Dairy Village, we want to go to Dairy Village. So. We can ensure, we can ensure proximity to the right folks at home. Well, I'm not used to being told I'm not loud enough. This is weird. <laughs> um, so we couldn't be any happier to bring the dynamic duo along to celebrate as our volunteers this year. I know, and Mary it is amazing, right? You yeah. or I being told we need the microphone. Oh, Mary. Um, certificate of Appreciation, Volunteers in Education, Kimberly Young, and Cassia Tessier. For valued service at Dairy Village Elementary School, we thank you so much. So now we are so excited to bring up our math club. Um, one of my most, the biggest aha moments when I went to Dairy Village was that how much kids love math there. And when um, I heard there was a math club, I'm like, okay. And then when I saw how many students participated, how many parents volunteered, and how many teachers did it, it knocked my socks off. And the kids go there, and um, of all abilities, in all levels of understanding math, and every single one of them walks away with new skills, and they're excited to do the activities. So I'm gonna bring Amy, who is the facilitator of it. She oversees everything. And then we have parents and um, teachers that also help out with this extra curriculum. So we're gonna bring Amy up, and the kids, come on up. So I'm just gonna do quick introductions. These are just a sample, oh, yep, yep, I'm sorry. These are just a sampling of some of my math students, or my mathletes, we call them, um, from grades two to five. I have Charlotte Sinclair, I have Eli and Dakota Cram, I have Avery and J.R. Allen, I have Sylvia Anderson, Brendan Kunsick, Jackson Collins, and Maddie, K oh, I always do this to your name. Cochran, Cochran. I always do that to your name. I apologize. And then one of my um, helpers for the math club is here tonight, Mrs. Devilar. 
Um, so I'm going to let them take over because this is their club. So Maddie, you want to come up and sit here? You know how to work it, right? Okay. All right. So our motto is we've got problems. The kids tie dyed their shirts this year. Um, so you ready? Go ahead. All right. So Jackson and Sylvia can take over. Math Club started in 2021. Math leads in grades 2 to 5 stay after school two times per month from 3 to 4.15 p.m., approximately 70 to 80 students each year. Teachers, assistants, and parent volunteers help run the club. We work on fluency, problem solving, and math reasoning through the use of games, puzzles, and competition practice questions. We train our brains to think and solve so we are ready to compete in a national math competition. The first two years, we held fundraisers to pay for all our expenses, competition, like competition, fees, snacks, games, shirts, and more. We have fun while learning. Last year, 14 DVS students scored in the top 50% nationwide and one student in the top 10%. There is a total of 35,384 total participants. I'm just going to add in that our student that scored in the top 10% is here presenting tonight. <laughs> These are some of the pictures uh, that we did. So pick out one and tell them what we were doing in there. The first one is when it was Pi Day and we were measuring the circumference and diameter of a circle. So in this, there is a question for grade two. Freddy the Frog is resting on a lily pad, as shown in the picture below. In one jump, Freddy can only go from one lily pad to another if they are connected by a single line. How many lily pads can Freddy not reach after one or two jumps? And on the far left, um, we can see that one lily pad he could not reach and then on the top right there's also one lily pad that he could not reach but all others that he can reach so the answer is two lily pads that he cannot reach <laughs> hello my name is avery allen i am practicing Practicing a competition, question 12 from grade 3. We know that two muffins weigh 80 grams. If the muffins weigh the same, then each muffin weighs 40 grams. A muffin plus a banana totals 150 grams. Then the banana is 150 minus 40 grams. So the banana weighs is 110 grams. In the addition problem below, the same letters represent the same digit and the different letters represent dif different digits. What three digit number does ABC represent? So we start with C. We need, we need three numbers that when all added together create a, a number that has eight in the ones place. I did it and it's and I did because I know that if we need three of them, three times C equals something. So I did three times one equals three, three times two equals six. 3 times 3 equals 9, 3 times 4 equals 12, 3 times 5 equals 15, and then I got 3 times 6 equals 18, so I regrouped the 10, and 
and then I know, and then now I know that for B, I need three numbers that equal something with a seven in the ones place. So I know that seven cannot be divided by three, and 17 can't be divided by three, but 27 can. So I divided that and I got nine plus the one that I regrouped. And then I had two, two tens regroup, two tens for A. And then I subtracted two from eight and I got three for the A's. So for what three digit number does A, B, C represent? I got 396. Figure below is formed using three squares of different sizes. The perimeter of each, the perimeter of the smallest square is 48 feet. What is the perimeter of the largest square? We know squares have all sides the same length. So if the small square's perimeter is 48 feet, each side is 12 feet because 48 divided by four is 12. Then 12 plus the four makes the medium square 16 by 16. The largest square, 16 plus the 12, make, is making it 28 by 28, resulting in the perimeter to be 112 feet because 28 times 4 is 112. This student is not feeling well today, but what I did was some of the kids that could not participate tonight I asked them why they joined Math Club to try and get a, um, a sampling. Um, so um, I'm just gonna read one of them. Um, Charlotte V from grade five said, I, wanted, I joined Math Club because I wanted to learn more about math and hang out with my friends. This year was better because of Math Club. So I'll take that. <laughs> we joined math club I joined math club because I enjoy doing math and learning new skills I like all the fun games and activities with my friends I joined math club because I wanted to do more math since I love math Now it's your turn. <laughs> Using the pieces of the puzzle given, you can make a triangle and then a square. Have fun. <laughs> so before my students are gonna go and give you each a little baggie, this is a puzzle actually that I found um, while watching the TV show Survivor and they had to do it. So you have to use the same pieces, rearrange them and you can have fun with that, take it home challenge. But I also wanted to recognize that this Thursday is when we do our national um, competition and we're gonna have 80 kids staying after school to compete this Thursday. So um, I just wanted to say good luck guys and I'm really proud of you. All right. Cool. You mentioned uh, Survivor. I'm thinking of uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader or a TV show? Well, I've heard some of them. I contemplate it myself. I just want to add that I have two mathletes at home and they really enjoy that club. They have a lot of fun, they learn a lot, and I think it's a great organization. Um, and then also as far as the DVS volunteers, thank you for all that you do. Uh, my two kiddos were hoping that you'd be at our school next year because of all the fun events that you plan. So just know, even if you're not, we'll probably be uh, sharing some of your notes with our new PTA.
I'm failing miserably. I need some assistance up here. Anybody can give me some help? Come on. I did it by myself. My wife is the puzzle brain of the family, all right? There can only be one. First of all, you guys did a wonderful job getting up there and speaking in front of all these people is not easy, but you did an excellent job. Yes, that's it. You rocked it. Yeah. And I was invited last year and uh, came into the gym and just amazed, first of all, at the number of students that were there and the number of staff with th that were there. And um, um, who said math isn't fun? Because uh, I saw it in action and it was outstanding. So to the staff, we thank you so much for what you do for the kids and for all you kids stepping up. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You're rocking it again. Awesome. Keep it up. Well done. It was a great job, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll take a quick minute, a quick two minute break, and we'll get it. We'll re re reconvene. Thank you.
All right, welcome back. Um, so now we have the Pinkerton update with Mr. Henry. Is that on? Okay, now it is. All right, so uh, science testing was today. Uh, so everyone knows what an SAT is, but science is not on the SATs. So we do a separate test uh, sci with, with just science topics so that the state can know how good we are at science. So I, I'm a sophomore, so I didn't do that today, but juniors did, and I'll be doing it next year. So uh, Astrothon, which is one of our biggest fundraisers, it was organized by student council. It was, uh, it's where students stay overnight and raise money, and they raised $26,000 for Boston Children's Hospital, which was pretty cool. Uh, faculty play is this Thursday and Friday at the Stockbridge. It'll be night at the Wax Museum, and uh, proceeds will be going towards student scholarships, so attend if you can. You'll be helping students. Spring sports also begin this week, so, you know, softball, baseball, lacrosse, that type of thing. College fair, that's tomorrow from 6 to 8 at the Hackler Gym, so if you have kids going into college soon, might want to go. And uh, my last thing, not technically Pinkerton related, but still important nonetheless, at the Dairy Friendship Center on April 18th, there will be Narcan administering seminar. I think it's really important for people my age to know what to do if they see someone overdosing. New Hampshire especially has a really big problem with opioids, so I think that's something that, you know, my classmates or even any of you, if you, if you ever see someone overdosing somewhere, you'll know what to do. So that'll be April 18th at, at the Dairy Friendship Center. Uh, and it's organized by Friendship Center, Dairy Fire Department, and Representative David Love. So that's happening then. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. All right, now we're at delegations individuals. So anybody willing to come up, we get you three minutes and state your name and address. Thank you, Erica Lay on 84 Shanita Road. Um, I'm coming with an update on House Bill 1583, which is the one that deals with the change in the adequacy format formula. Um, I did receive a good amount of feedback by people on the board here, and a lot of those concerns about um, what the caps, how they were dealt with, and some of the other concerns were shared by people in the Finance Committee. For that reason, the amendment that would have increased um, the adequacy to 7,300, approximately $7,000, did not move forward because the idea of there being donor towns became such a situation that this was not something that was going to be able to pass the House floor this year. So the House, the will, bill will be moving on as it initially passed the house. I have the numbers of how it impacts the town of Derry. Our adequacy per, uh, for the number of students we have will go up by $1 million. Across the state, it goes up by $34.3 million. It adds the relief funding, which gives us um, $404,000 out of the uh, $22.3 million across the state. And in the fiscal capacity disparity aid, we receive $2.6 million out of the $39 million across the state. Um, quite honestly, I wasn't sure about voting for that coming out of the first committee because we aren't getting as much as some of the other towns and we do have our challenges. But I do think that this is going to move us forward. Um, there's a movement, there's a, did this just cut? Okay, um, it seems like it cut out completely, okay. If you can hear me, that's great. Um, so it'll be moving forward as with an ought to pass. Um, there are people that just want to continue to study it so we can make sure that we're not piecemeal moving things around and then just creating more disparity. So um, I'll be supporting it. I expect that, uh, I believe the delegation will be as well. Um, there's another one as well, which would be separating out special education funding, and that has it in the three different classifications. I've sent a request to get the number of students that we have in each of those because that's not provided by the Department of Education because in smaller districts that causes a challenge in identifying students. That may be a challenge here as well, but I do want to know how much um, setting out different amounts of reimbursement based on the amount of need of special education students will impact dairy because we do such an excellent job of educating special education students and their people who come here for their services. So I'd like to make sure that this does help um, defray some of that because we do a great job and uh, our town shouldn't be punished for being good at special education. 
So thank you. And Eric, I have your request for that. I do have a call into the state because I have some conflicting information that I'm getting from the system. So um, I have a call out to get some clarification on that. Okay, um, thank you. And if you even can give any sort of round spitball numbers, at least we'll get an idea of what we think it will do for dairy. If that gets to be too personally identifiable, um, we don't need to, but I just wanted to know how much of a benefit it would have to our town. Okay, but yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't narrow down that much, so I should be able to give you at least general information. I just, there was one thing for clarification that I needed from the state that I'm still waiting on. I appreciate it. I was up at the eclipse yesterday, so I wouldn't have been working on it today anyways. Thank you. Do you get Eric, you one second? I think, see if you have any questions. Sure. Board? Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One, the special education funding, is that separate or is that in addition to adequacy, uh, the adequacy that we get? And I forgot my second question. Um, so I'll answer that one while you have the other one. Um, so our adequacy has the base adequacy. Right now we're at $4,182 per student. The bill as it's moving forward go to $4,404 per student. Um, Sorry, I minimized it here because I was looking for clarity. We also have free and reduced lunch. Um, is an ad For every student who receives that, we receive an additional $2,346 per student. For special education, currently everybody is in one bracket, which is $2,142. And then English language learners who are receiving services, it's another $816 for those students. Um, this is just to address the different needs of the students. So that is in addition to that adequacy. Okay. And and it would start with that as the base for those students who are in the classroom full uh, classroom for 80% more of the day, and it goes to a multi multiplier of the base adequacy based on how much need there is for the student. And you mentioned um, going to st interim study. If this is already passed in the court, is there not some kind of defining measure there that says it really doesn't need to be studied anymore? I guess I'm trying to understand where, where the pieces fall and, and how it's determined when to stop studying and uh, move forward. Uh, th because uh, as the bill would move forward right now with the House as it passed the first, um, as it passed the uh, first policy committee, that's $4,400 um, and $400 per student. That's not the $7,000 that was um, listed by the judge. Mm -hmm. When we do that, it is hundreds of millions of dollars more. And when we're not in a budget year, um, it was a matter of how do we make that up. Because this is statewide and because of the idea that especially with the statewide education property tax or any other statewide method, the, the, the bill took that an increase swept to have that increased number. And that's one of the issues that brought about the conflict because we have to raise $200 million. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in the budget right now because now revenues are declining. There's not other areas to bring it from. We can't really redo the entire budget because what are we going to defund? And because it's statewide, there was the idea to use a statewide education property tax. However, there were people who didn't think that that was a fair way. There were donor towns that didn't want to donate it to other towns and have to give that money back. And while there was a really good faith effort to try to implement what the judge had, had ruled, the order has been stayed at this point. And the idea of trying to create a bad solution that nobody is happy with in order to get it done now, as opposed to trying to look at a way to meet this in a budget year, which is the more appropriate time to handle it, um, that's why there's a move for interim study. So I, I completely understand the financial situation. There's a lot of other things going on in the state that are going to require um, a payout by the state. And we'll just leave it at that for now. So I guess I don't understand. So is there is there a bill that is going to provide us with additional adequacy, or is it going to, is it in, going to go inter, into into I can't say it interim study? Um, it came out of finance um, with two-thirds of the people voting in favor of ought to pass um, the way that it came out of the policy committee. So that's the one that would increase us by, let me get to my sum here, by $3 million when we get to the, uh, the hold harmless because we actually don't get quite as much of the hold harmless because that's just trying to keep us up with the pace of inflation based on a prior year. Um, just the number of students we have, everything else, if you go with a straight equation, we'd actually be getting less than we're getting right now. 
So the way that they all work together with the moving pieces, we don't get all of those increases just because we have this extra makeup payment. Um, so it will be increasing it, and it will be spending um, $80 million more with us getting $3 million of it. But going to a $7,000 per student base adequacy is not something that was feasible in any of the ways that they tried. And they tried hard. Um, the question is, do we want a little bit right now, or do we want to just keep studying it? I'm going to be voting for it because I think a little bit's better than nothing. Yeah, and I remember the original donor town. It's not a place, a good place to be, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. David, can I just say one? Erica, just first of all, thank you for all your work. Um, and it's important that you mention how much we'd be receiving for every student on free and reduced meals, which I think you said 2,346. Just today, I received, um, I am the second authorizer on applications that come in, and we had two applications today that qualified for reduced, and six applications that came in today that qualified for free. So I can't stress enough to families, not only does it help them when they are in a time of need, but that goes towards the district as part of the adequacy numbers. So um, there is money that comes back to the district for those numbers are free and reduced. So um, it is important for people who are in need to fill out those applications, even if it is in April and they think that um, you know, we're at the end of the year that they can only fill it out in the beginning of the year. So we just want to remind people they can fill them out at any time. Two of the applications where people had no income to report because they recently lost their jobs. So um, thank you. And that's important for people to keep filling those out. Thank you. That's a very important point. And that's actually in addition to the money that the school gets for those lunches. So that just pays for the fact that it, it sort of goes into the property values and everything else. So it's a way to just to sort of make things fair. And as a reduced lunch kid myself, there's nothing wrong with saying that uh, your family could use a little bit of help. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Elizabeth Cochran, 8 Dexter Street. I just wanted to bring up a couple of things. So during the July 23rd meeting, at roughly 34 minutes and 28 seconds, a slide was presented with target milestones to be made, one being co-curricular input from admin and the DEA, with a deadline of August of 2023. It was mentioned on a post on the Dairy Education Association page on February 8th that they were not included in a number of decisions regarding the reorganization. So this appears that this milestone was never completed. This is just one milestone, but it makes me question just how many other milestones with target dates that we have overlooked, not completed, or disregarded during the continuation of this planning. Also in that slide, it says present 24-25 co-curricular plans to the school board with a deadline of September 2023. However, this was pre presented at the March 11th meeting by Joe at roughly one hour, 22 minutes, and 59 seconds, and it still appears to be an undecided upon at this time. This opens up a lot of questions for me. It mentions allocating some funds from the elementary for these programs. How does that affect the elementary kids, and when will we know what is being allocated where and exactly for what grade levels? What is actually set in stone at this time? You plan to have clubs in intramural, but do we have coaches and advisors? What will these options be? Will they be right after school? Is it said that it was said that there is an after school program? If the extracurriculars are not right after school, will the after school program run until these options begin and end and parents can pick up their children? How many students can actually attend the after school program? Also, on March 26th meeting, it was mentioned the state that West Running Brook is in. Why are we just finding out now about the severity of that condition of wall banding? And why are we moving even more children into the school under those conditions? I would also like to know where David Clapp gets his financial numbers on certain things. Leading up to voting, you mentioned a $2 million savings closing DVS on the Derry, New Hampshire Schools and Community Facebook page. What is the data on exactly where that went? Also, at the March 26th meeting, it was determined it was more of a 600K savings. 
Also on that same Facebook page, it has been mentioned about having 1,000 empty seats, but on the April 2nd budget meeting, at roughly one hour, 11 minutes, and 44 seconds, Joe seems pretty confused where that number came from and claims it is a number and changes daily, but is more about how many empty classrooms we have. But when asked about how many classrooms we have across the board, there was no answer. So were the savings amount and empty seats used as a smoke and mirror effect? And when can we know exactly how many open classrooms we have across the board? And if most of the space is in the middle schools, is redistricting the elementary schools going to allow for extra classrooms to be used as extra space just like we have now? Or are they going to be too full? I still feel there are way too many things to be ironed out at this time, and the plan should be halted. I still wear my many DVS shirts with pride and will still keep holding on to keeping DVS open. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to request that what I read gets put into the meeting minutes, exactly how I read it. So, and then I'd like to request an amendment to the December 12th meeting to reflect exactly what I read. Good evening, Michael Leon, 84 Sinedo Road. Um, I want to begin by recognizing Mr. Henry, the last thing he said, the absolute importance of that. Um, for people to understand how to administer Narcan, you do not have to be a drug addict. You don't have to use drugs. People are poisoned with drugs, not intentionally. I can't fathom being a young person today going out. Um, some, I was telling Mr. Henry right before the meeting started, you can have Narcan on your person attached to you. You pass out. If someone else there doesn't know how to use the drug, it doesn't matter whether you have it or not. So I, I would encourage people to go. It, it is an absolute amazing opportunity. Um, also, good news, I want to thank this committee. It has been noticeable. The first meeting that I came to, there was a wonderful agenda that I think laid out. The meeting was well run. Um, I saw decorum here, which uh, that was very refreshing. So I want to say thank you to that. From that, though, I need to back up. At the last elections, there were two items on two different ballots, one for students and one for adults that were non-binding. And they had, I guess for the students, they had a pretty good outcome because the teachers and the administrators actually listened to what the non-binding items said. That wasn't so much for schools. A lot of people in this town are very, very invested in dairy schools. What the majority of this board did at the first board meeting is absolutely inexcusable. Voting to keep closing a school when you can't say how much money you're going to lose, or sorry, not lose, how much money you're going to save. This district has closed a school recently and didn't wind up saving money. It, it, it baffles the mind how this could happen. We saw there was two choices that this board was given. And I've got to say, coming from the superintendent, this insulted every one of you, or it should have. There was two pieces of paper for two giant decisions to be made that had to be made right then, even though you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Was that really all of the items you could come up with from an entire school budget was two pieces of paper? I'm sorry no one made the motion to say, other, cancel both of those, and let's get a more detailed budget so we can make better informed decisions. I was very much personally in favor of closing one of the schools until I talked with parents and realized what a gift we have in Derry an amazing gift of these small community schools. Chat with people around the state. We're really, really gifted to have that here. The school board has an opportunity, and I hope they'd reconsider what happened on that first meeting and consider what the town of Derry has said. The marketing that happened last year to say that we needed a new school, there was no plan in place. You're just now getting around to having strategy. That's absolutely amazing, $70 million. The town spoke very clearly to this board. I hope the board listens to the voters and the people of this town. I think the majority of people value education, as I certainly do. And uh, those of you that do value education, thank you. Thank you.
All right, I guess we'll move on to transportation. Hi, everybody. Um, Cliff is not with us today, so I'm going to pitch pinch hit as the transportation person. So we just want to talk a little bit about uh, the three-tier busing plan. Um, last week when we met, there was uh, excuse, yep, uh, there was a um, question that was raised wanting some detail, some information about about the new um, busing proposal that we put forward. So we wanted to kind of walk you through that. Shandra uh, Welch is here, who is uh, our uh, point of contact manager of the dairy office of first student uh, she can come up and uh, be ready to answer questions i promised her that i would kind of walk through the slideshow and then she's the technical expertise um, and just um, just so you guys understand a lot of the great ideas that were kind of born out of this plan i think came from chandra and her experience um, in busing so the term three tier can be a little bit confusing, so we just want to explain um, we have a two tier system right now, which means that our early morning tier is our Pinkerton and our middle school buses. They run at the same time. Uh, they don't run together in that middle school kids don't ride with high school kids, but the buses are out on the roads at the same time. That's tier one. And then when those uh, uh, routes finish, the bus company goes off and does tier two, which is our elementary routes. So that's Hopefully that's that's the starting point. We want to make sure everybody had a had a sense for what we mean because the term tier for me is a little bit uh, strange. So um, this is our uh, proposed three tier plan that we've worked through with Chandra and the folks at First Student. So what it would do is it would divide out our high school and our uh, middle school and intermediate intermediate runs. So there would actually be three tiers. So the first tier would be our high school runs. They would drop off at the same time that they've been dropping off. The second tier would be our Gilbert H. Hood Middle School and West Running Brook Intermediate School runs. Those would be separate runs. So the middle school students would be on one set of buses and the uh, intermediate school students would be on another set of buses. When those complete, we would then begin our third tier, which is our elementary school uh, runs. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the differences here, um, but really in the morning, there will be very few differences. Um, there will be more buses um, at that intermediate middle level, so the bus routes will be shorter. Uh, so that's another benefit of this three-tier system. Um, the big difference, uh, really there's uh, very few differences in the morning other than shorter runs. The, the drop-off times are the same. Um, as you see here, uh, there'll be 18 buses, which is in addition to what we have currently for high school, then there'll be 29 buses dedicated to that tier two, which again is, is um, middle school and intermediate, and then there'll be 26 buses dedicated to the third tier, um, the elementary run. The change that we see is actually in the afternoon because of the way the Pinkerton school day and the middle school days, uh, they don't operate exactly the same as you guys probably know. I know Anthony Henry knows this. There's a uh, passing time that's built into the day at Pinkerton Academy because the campus is so big. So their day is actually a little bit longer than ours. Um, so this plan would actually in the afternoon have the intermediate and middle school kids picked up first uh, before the high school students. When those runs are finished, the tier two in the afternoon would become the high school runs and then tier three would stay with elementary. Chandra, you're gonna cut me off if I make a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. So far, so good, good. Um, and the, what, so the big difference is for those high school students, um, they may have to wait a few minutes for the buses to, so let me back up. Some of our buses uh, right now pick up right away and then we have some buses that show up later for high school. So in this setup, all of our buses would be in that later group that would come for high school. But the, so even though students might be waiting a few minutes more at Pinkerton, their bus routes will be shorter. So they'll actually get home likely either at the same time or earlier. Is that accurate? That is correct. Okay. So um, I know I've gone through this quickly, but um, the primary benefits here is we have a full fleet of buses that we can use at our intermediate and middle school level, which allows us to divide up our 
seventh and eighth graders on one set of buses and our fifth and sixth graders on, on another set of buses. We didn't be necessarily believe that that was going to be efficiently possible until Chandra and the team at First Student came up with this, this plan. It also provides more buses for Pinkerton students, which means shorter bus routes. Um, and it still provides us with uh, buses for after school activities. And in the end, it's an overall reduction of one bus from the fleet. So as you saw, there were some savings um, that we're projecting uh, from this. And I, that is the entire presentation. And Chandra's nodding that I haven't screwed anything up so far. But I want to know if you guys have questions. So my bus happens to be the last bus to arrive at Pinkerton. I do not leave Pinkerton until 2.35 usually. And last bell rings at 158. So that's a pretty long wait. Uh, and I do like to see that it's decreased a little for me. So I like it, but <laughs> we'll see how it works. So with this plan, Hood and West Running Brook are going to start within five minutes of each other? Yeah, currently right now the plan, right now Gilbert H. Hood and West Running Brook, they have a staggered about five minute different start time. So that's what this plan is, yes. So what's the plan for the families that have students in both schools and do drop off or pick up? So um, most of our, uh, that's a great question. So for some families who have to go to both schools, they may have to drop off a little earlier at the first school and then go over to the second school. We have many students that arrive at Gilbert H. Hood pretty early, well before the bell. And what will they be doing during that time? Um, they'll, be, they'll be supervised by staff at Gilbert H. Hood. I think in the past they've gone down and had breakfast in the cafeteria. So that's going to be, that's not something that the families have to pay for as a early drop-off care, correct? Correct. Uh, is this on? Yep. All right. Uh, Chandra, thanks for being here tonight. So the one concern I see, potential, um, and I'm assuming this can be figured out, but uh, I see that Pinkerton, if they leave at 2.20 uh, and their potential or their longest ride times, uh, 35 minutes, it makes it 2.55. Um, uh, and then looking at the elementary buses, if there's delays, there are families that have high school students that watch their elementary uh, age kids. Um, so I have a little bit of concerns there. My assumption is that the routes that are set up, if there are overlaps in families, that say a Pinkerton, a Pinkerton rider would be home earlier than that, uh, and a, that elementary rider would be on a route that is going to arrive later, um, early, as opposed to earlier. Yeah, the there, if you see, there are the majority of the runs are significantly shorter, and the maximum ride time is 35 because there's obviously some routes that go way out there, and we'll never make it back. It's just we wouldn't be able to do it in sure. 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, but all of those Pinkerton buses for the most part, would be heading to an elementary school directly after anyway. Okay. I know the, uh, the dismissal time and the start times having a buffer between the intermediate and middle school was a discussion that we had earlier in transportation. I'm assuming that that you know that five minutes is currently built into the difference between those schools, but I'm assuming that that's all that we can do between those two schools without disrupting everything. Yeah, we we've talked about it. I mean, it's tight. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to do any more than a five minute window in between the two. When the scenarios that we've run, it's been it was going to be challenging regardless of which. Even when we were looking at two tier systems, we were we were pretty tight up against it. But I don't know if Chandra, you have any thoughts on that? In the morning, it wouldn't be as hard. In the afternoon, it would definitely be more of a time constraint. Um, in the morning, we have more flexibility with drop off times. Like the schools will allow us to drop off five minutes early, or per se, and so there is a little bit more flexibility in the morning, but less per se in the afternoon. What is the earliest that a family will be able to drop off at Hood in the morning?
Hello? Okay. I'm unsure if they have set an earliest drop off. I, I know that I, I believe that there are families that drop off right now um, just before seven in the morning. Um, we do have a little bit of a challenge with supervision. So we um, teacher, this, I think the teacher day may start at 7.05. I'm getting a nod over there from the audience. So that means any supervision provided before then is likely done by administration. Okay, and what do you think it usually takes? I'm, I'm just picturing currently um, how long it takes for me to go through the Dairy Village drop-off. Um, what do you estimate for time for drop-off at Hood School? I don't have that number right now. I can tell you that it's quicker than the elementary drop-off just because of the, the size and the layout of the driveway. The Dairy Village, I, I know exactly, I've been stuck in that drop-off before. It is uh, kind of one way in and one way out, which makes it really, really hard to drop off. And they also have a, a, a much more um, uh, fixed drop-off set of procedures. Um, so I think it's a little bit quicker at the, at the middle school. Okay, I think it's important to be sharing that information with our families as we're looking at this, trying to figure out the logistics of how we're gonna get our children around more than just the busing, um, but those of us that are gonna have to be bringing our children to multiple schools. Um, you know, at this point it could be one, two, or three schools dealing with this traffic in these times. So it, I think that we should have put a lot more consideration into exactly what that looks like and, and how people are gonna be able to get from one side of town to the other and known understanding better how long it takes to drop off and be moving around like that. That's very important information for a family. Uh, you guys talked with some of the other towns that have intermediate schools and, you know, in the, over the course of the last year. Or so I think Bedford has separate buses and their intermediate middles, I think, start at the exact same time. And then Wyndham does combined buses, but I think there, and there's like five minutes between, you know, to make the two stops. Did you get any input from those other towns, you know, how the, that works out for them? Um, we, we did, we, we spoke to, you know, Wyndham, Bedford and Merrimack about their transportation. Um, and every town is a little bit different. I know that when we had spoken to Wyndham last year, they had tried a few different things in their district because they were kind of new. I, I want to say they were only a few years into that um, to that model, and they had had, um, I think, both shared and separate uh, routes. So yes, we did talk to them. We took a lot of notes, and, and you know, when we built this this model, we believe that it's you know in line with what other school districts are doing but I don't remember off the top exactly what each of them have done. One more question for as far as um, pickup. If a family is coming, you know, they're picking up at Hood first and then rushing over to West Running Brook, how long will staff be out there waiting with their students or, or what's that pickup going to look like? Yeah, so um, the there are students that likely will, if they are waiting to be picked up after the dismissal time, they'll have to wait probably inside the building if it's um, if there are no staff members that are outside supervising. How long? Um, we, I, I don't know how long that would take, but we haven't had issues before with with parents picking up a little bit after dismissal. Have you guys looked at numbers at all of how many families that there are in the district that you would anticipate might have children at both the intermediate and middle schools next year? I have not run those numbers. I don't know if uh, the bus company has looked at that because we, we've run a lot of scenarios. We have run a ton of scenarios. I don't know the, um, the exact number off the top of my head, but I know we have multiple buses going to the same stop. Um, <laughs> so that would tell me that there's either neighbors or um, families that are going to, to multiple schools. Right. Well, we could run that. Yep. That'd be a good piece of information to have. Yep. So do we know that there's going to be staff available before and after school when students are dropped off early or picked up later because for whatever reason, because that doesn't really happen now. I mean, it, somebody misses a bus or 
something else had they forget something they run back in or, or those kind of things are somebody available but they don't they're not really there for late or early late late pickup or early drop off right so so it would likely fall on the shoulders of administration um, if we're talking about um, a couple minutes, five minutes, yeah, I think that's well within the reasonableness. Um, if we're talking about an hour or, or things, which I don't think that's what you guys are talking about. We are talking about the normal travel from one school to another, so which we estimate about five minutes or so, yeah. Have you ever tried to get across town from Hood to West Reading Brook after school time? I, I don't think that's, it's gonna take a little more than five minutes. Um, and I'm really concerned with this plan, and I do think that this should have been a lot more definites and not as many probablys and maybes at this point in planning. I have a question. Uh, so we deal with this currently in our current plan, right? What we're talking about today? Um, I think the concern, yes, I think the concern that's being raised, which I think is a valid concern, is right now we don't have a lot of families that have kids at both West Running Brook and Gilbert H. Hood. We will next year. Well, to be fair, we're not sure how many people are going to be going to both West Running Brook and, but my assumption is, is like David said, is that kids arrive early to both middle schools today. Kids stay late at both middle schools today. So it's not going to be a new problem that way. I see uh, an increase, um, a slight increase uh, of that. Um, but yeah, this is not a new problem. It just, we might just see a little bit more of it. And um, yeah. It, I don't think it's a new thing. I think it's something that I think we can handle. I don't think in middle school there are students that are there early or late without a reason. They might be there for a club or maybe they're there for breakfast, but they're not just they're not dropped off in the morning because somebody's trying to get to another school on time. That's I don't think that's correct. And Chandra it said there's a lot of multiple stops, multiple yeah. Same stops. Same stops yes. <laughs> um, but I, I have another question though. This three-tier plan. Why hasn't this been ever proposed to us before? No oh, idea. That is a, that's a, a great question, actually. It is something that um, I worked with Hampstead um, years years ago, right. and they've been running in this for ever and a day. You are obvious, obviously. <laughs> It's off, turns on. Um, obviously, we're a lot different than Hampstead or Merrimack or Bedford, for that matter. Correct. Um, so it's hard to compare them, and it's hard to compare the terrain of our town with the other towns as well. So that changes the routes and changes the timing. Um, but I, I, I do know of the three-tier system in Hampstead, um, and I honestly just thought it was because they were smaller that it was they could do it. So I'm interested to see how this works out. But I also agree with Katie. Another indication of we're not really ready for prime time. As it stands right now, DEEP and the elementary school has started around the same time, right? 820, 30, something like that. So the, the morning session at DEEP starts, so yes. Um, so I'm curious if there are families that currently deal with that, having to drop a child off at deep and at elementary, and that's within five to 10 minutes of each other now. Um, is there like, a, there is like a three buses are able to go after school? Activities. Thank you. You say like a three buses available after school activities. What about like uh, there's like a more activities that require another bus? So you're asking if those if if uh, those there's buses are enough that require another bus that day. Yeah. So so 
Go ahead, Shonda. Pretty much all of our, our big bus drivers are cross-trained to drive small buses as well. Um, so that does open up. It, it's just three drivers. So whatever bus capacity you're looking for, we should be able to handle. I think probably more specifically, would, is three buses sufficient for our after-school activities? We, we, for the majority, we currently run two. Um, and if it's just going to be one school instead of two schools going, then it really should reduce your bus needs. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> I'll just say thank you for figuring out the three tier for dairy because. I think that has a lot of opportunity. I just don't think it has, I'm concerned about the plan that we're using it for, but I do like the three-tier plan. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, oh. All right. May I make a request? Um, the slides from this were not included in the agenda items that were online. Would it be possible to add these in because these busing changes are important? Thank you. All right. Our next agenda item is. Thank you, Shonda. Budget, re budget reduction meeting we had last week. We finalized the numbers, and the administration put together the final document that was distributed to everybody. Um, I'd like to open it up for a discussion to discuss any last-minute items that people want to discuss before we vote on this. I was not in favor of taking it, the custodians out of this plan last week or whenever that was, and I still am not. I think we should put them back in, especially in light of the snowstorm and all that was needed to be done that day and the days following. Um, what, what would you propose to um, change, switch there? I don't honestly know. I just think that they should be added back in. And the other thing is we talk about the buildings needing care and attention. This is honestly, no offense to our custodians, short money for the work that they do and the hours that they work. Um, I would agree with that, especially in the discussions we've had about overages that we have at the end of the year with our budget. Um, I think that we really can fine tune some things and bring back the custodian positions. I, I would probably say the board would be in favor of that if we hear an alternative solution as far as what, how do we get below the default. So, I mean, I, it, it was said last week, you know, we all, it was an open discussion about ideas. Um, there weren't very many ideas thrown out there um, other than what was presented to us. Uh, so um, yeah, again, I would, I would echo David's sentiments as, uh, you know, I would say if someone feels that strongly about it, then make a motion to change it and offset it with 100, uh, another $110,000 somewhere else. Um, that would be my suggestion. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, 
if we're come if we're going to be asking to make changes, we got to come with a solution. Um, we can't just say, hey, you know, we need to cut. We we need to. Change, I'd like to to fund one hundred ten thousand dollars, and then let the other five or six people figure it out. So eliminate the email filter. That's twelve. Okay, so now you're ninety eight thousand short. So where does that ninety eight thousand dollars come from? The well, administrator position. And we weren't provided a full budget to go through last week, so how would we know everything that could be cut? The budget was presented at the deliberative session and in in, in all along the entire budget meeting. A lack of preparation and coming up prepared is not an excuse for not being ready to make solutions. Well, I, well, I think it's a legitimate question that if you want to take something out, you gotta, you, you gotta f substitute it. I, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with that suggestion. Well, where we were. This, where did this discussion go about pos the possibility of having a special meeting to add back to the budget, or to have a special opportunity to add money to rep repair? buildings or West Reddingbrook for that matter. We had those things here, but we never really discussed them. Where were they discussed and why didn't they happen? I'm going to get the budget out of my car. Last week at the budget discussion when we talked about bringing, um, keeping that additional administrator uh, position at $150,000, do we have details on that as to where that position will be and what that position is? Uh, can I make a suggestion? Please. Um, it got um, shot down, but Laura and Jane brought up last time about uh, we did the 10 regular ed. They indicated that they believed we could do 10, um, up to 10, 10 or 12 um, resource um, at Pinkerton. And um, there was some discussion about that. I would like to bring that up again. Austin, can you just clarify on the administrator position? I think there's a lot going around about what that position is. Um, you explained it as an assistant principal, a building administrator. Um, is that in fact correct that that position, this administrator position that's built in here is an assistant principal? That is the, when you cut that position, that's who would be cut, would be um, one of our newest uh, members of the administrative team. So the 150 just builds in the entire comp package, right? I think, I think there's yeah, some- Yeah, it's, it's some like we do with most of the positions. It's an estimate of um, all of the benefits. It's a salary and all of the benefits that go along with it, um, retirement, it's a, uh, taxes, et cetera. I think that people are misunderstanding, I'm not I'm saying the board, but in general, there's been an understanding in the public that this is a, an SAU, not, not that it, it ma I'm not saying it should be one way or the next, but I think people seem to feel strongly that it's an, a, an SAU administrator versus a building administrator. And we, there's no opinion on my end there, I just, just so we can clarify, because that, that question keep, has come up quite a we bit. We would cut one of the building administrators, we would replace that position because we wouldn't want to have uh, a building without an assistant principal. Th that's so what I'm trying to get to. So it would be an SAU cut. This, the position that was built here that we voted on last week, the 150, that's total comp for a building assistant principal, correct? Correct. Thank you. So cutting that position, would that have any impact on the position for the student wellness coordinator? The, the one thing I'll say on the student wellness is that's a position or a, a body of work that has been asked for a lot 
uh, over the course of the year, at least the last year of what are we doing for students, what are we doing for students, how are we helping with transition, how are we helping with mental health, wellness, all these other things. That position has been asked for in some capacity for quite a while uh, at many board meetings, in many communications, and many asked to board members, what are we doing to help with transitions? That position encompasses all of student wellness. So I'm, I'll just say that. That didn't really answer my question, though, as far as if we were to cut that administrative position, would we be losing a, an assistant principal, but we would continue the coordinator of student wellness, or we would lose the position of coordinator of student wellness? We would lose the human being who's an assistant principal. We would lose the position of wellness. So Austin made a proposal of reducing resources just by 12, it looks like, and that's 111,456. So that's what's on the table that Austin just brought up as a potential for, and this is similar to what we did last week with the general education at Pinkerton. If you remember, the, our budget, um, we usually over budget, not intentionally, but it, it just works out that way. So this would be narrowing that number down like by taking away our, bringing down our estimate. And I think last week the numbers were $1.3 million between the two if you add them together, the, sa um, the savings currently. So this would bring it down, our estimate down another, another 12 students at 111,456 if we were to move on that right now. Wasn't our concern that if we had somebody that needed services that were over that, that we would be in a really tough position? I mean, we did discuss this at that last meeting, and there was a reason why we didn't do that, right, Laura? I don't know. So if we were to cut the coordinator of student wellness, would each of our schools still have a principal and assistant principal? Yes. yes. But our district would not have a coordinator of student wellness which we currently do not have, correct? Correct. We have a lot of things currently that we do not have that we're adding in, but um, not to use argument, but once again, we're talking about listening to the director of special services student services and the business administrator, just like we did with the, when you say there wouldn't be services, of course there'd be services. We are guesstimating that just like with the 10 regular ed students, if we had somebody that came and needed to be at Pinkerton Academy, they'd be edu educated at Pinkerton Academy. But we do this We've done this a number of times each year. And if you're asking me if, if I would prefer to reduce um, what we've been seeing over time as a declining number of kids at Pinkerton Academy, not that we're not sending them there, they're just not there. They're being removed over time as, as Laura explained it. Sometimes it's a third of a kid because the kid leaves in March. Sometimes it's two thirds of a kid because they, but when you add those all up compared to losing a um, administrator that we believe is moving this district forward and we're doing it in lieu of three custodians who no longer have a building I'm fine with keeping custodians. Just like we've, you know, if we could have kept an extra nurse, that would be great. If we could keep an extra counselor, that would be great. But we have to make some cuts. And if, if you folks are um, bound and determined to keep these three custodial positions, 
which we were planning to use for extra duty um, because we don't need to add a, a, take three buildings and add a custodian to those places. They are fully staffed as we speak, but I'm okay with um, keeping these in, but doing it in a way that doesn't take somebody else away. I'm going back to the, as far as reducing the resource numbers at Pinkerton. Um, we, when I'm making the budget at the beginning of the year and, we, and we're going through that, I'm using actual students to make those determinations and to make those proposals. Um, what we're seeing as a trend year after year is, reduce, is a reduction in students that are registered at Pinkerton. Um, so every year we kind of come down a little bit more and come down a little bit more. Um, Jane had gone through some numbers last week and there is a significant difference between what we had planned for at the beginning of this year and what we have for students now um, in resource. So it's always a gamble. We could plan for every single student and have everybody budgeted from you know eighth grade on through 12th grade and I could have four families move in and end up with 10 kids added on to my special ed roster. No matter, how, no matter how I do it, it is a gamble. So what we have seen is a trend of reduction in numbers, whether it be from charter schools, kids going to high set, kids going to ombudsman, um, students that are doing the adult ed program. Um, you know, so there's many options at Pinkerton that students that go in as a resource student may opt for other options as they go through. So that's where the reduction in numbers comes in. Um, and then students moving in and out. So you're confident, or I shouldn't say confident, but comfortable with the number 12? Based on the numbers that um, we are getting right now from Pinkerton, based on last year, yes. So I'm gonna move that we reduce the um, resource, the Pinkerton resource number by 12, and add the three custodians back into the budget. All right, we got first by Jason. Second. Second by Michael. Before we vote, any discussion? I'm just going to caution us that we gambled with the health insurance, and that that gamble cost us 200. What happens with our Pinkerton students? I, I'm nervous about that, to be honest. I, I think if we're in a situation where we all want to keep people, we have to cut somewhere, as the chair said, and as Jonathan said, we've got to find $110,000. If we eliminate the administrator position, the student wellness position goes away and then the cut becomes a newer assistant principal so a building administrator uh, somebody and who, who is in the schools again there's a person so i think if we're going to bring the custodians back in we've got to find the money and we've got to if if the if jane and laura both feel comfortable we're going to have to take some sort of risk and, and take some sort of gamble there and i get it brenda we you know we we swung and missed on, on insurance, but the money has to come from somewhere. We can't just add it back in without it coming from somewhere. And if the whole idea is to keep people, then we've got to cut something that's more of an arbitrary number where hopefully at the end of the year, the number shakes out. Jane, I have a question for you. So on these three positions, um, you've mentioned there's been a lot of turnover in the, in the custodians. Are you confident that you can fill these positions for a whole year if we were to do this? Because I don't want them to sit there vacant and we just did something that we, you know, we wouldn't want to do. So in your, in your opinion, can we keep these positions filled the whole year based on you talk about tr turnover and what happened in the last couple of years? So they're not vacant now. They're people who are in those positions. Um, do they turnover sure um do we struggle to fill them yes they're a difficult position to fill they're kind of like assistants um you just can't really fill them so so it seems like then it would be all the more sense to keep them where we have them preserve them and then deal with potential turnover um and if a position goes unfilled and we end up with an, an overage or something on the back end with the bottom line budget the, the funds would just be reallocated. 
if we're going to keep the three positions. It just makes me nervous to gamble on kids and not a new position that we have in the budget. Right, so, but what I, I think what what everybody has said is what is the alternative then? We've got to find $110,000. Where does the 110000 and if we're talking about kids, I would say an assistant principal in the school has a pretty big impact on the kids. The director or coordinator of student wellness will have an impact on the kids. We're, we're talking about keeping people. Those are positions that we can keep. We take a gamble on some way. We, we can't do both. We can't keep everybody and not find $110,000. We've, we've got to find it. So when I went to get these papers out of my car, I walked into a conversation that was every school will have a principal and an assistant principal. So obviously I missed something because the wellness coordinator is a new position. There's nobody in that now. It doesn't exist. Right. So the position in question is for a building assistant principal. That's what we discussed last week. Austin clarified that again for us tonight. If we were to eliminate that position, the director, coordinator of student wellness, that position would go away. But the position that we would lose would be a building assistant principal, a, one of the newer assistant principals. Say it again. The person we would lose is a current that, that's did I, that what I not, not what I said. You said principal. the position. Oh, the, the person, sorry. We, we've said this now like two or three times, so my apologies. Would it be helpful to, um, I think Joe is, Joe is prepared to show the chart that is in the board packet for Pinkerton, if we can get that up there. Um, I think it might be helpful for you to see the numbers, and I agree, I hate to gamble on those things. Um, but I think to show you, this is a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet that I've been tracking. I do every uh, five-year historical data back to 1920, and you can see the trends now, 1920 obviously with the COVID years and um, 2021, so that you can see where my general tuition is up on the top, and. Um, I think we're zoomed in closer now for resource. And you can see historically what we've budgeted for. Now, mind you, those budgeted numbers are also, they include what the board voted to um, reduce in addition to the normal projections. Like Laura said, she's budgeting for students who actually are having services in eighth grade and promoting them up and the kids who should be getting services in the upper grades. And the same thing for general ed. So you can see on the bottom row for each one of them, even the general ed, where in the three billings, what the difference was. And if you look at the resource, 1920, you know, you had 27, 26, 24 less students. And then you can see going over across. So um, it looks like the one that's in there in the packet doesn't have, um, okay, so that's the wrong chart. The correct one is actually in the budget book, so I'm not, sh that's the wrong one. The number is the same, it's just missing the final years, but the chart is in my board packet. Um, hold on just one second, please. And E. I'm not sure why that, it's in the board packet, but not up there, I'm sorry. Uh, but for resource, this year we had, in our final billing, 36 less students, 45 less students in the second building, and 51 less students in the third billing, with a surplus of 377,000. So if I were to take, and looking at those trends, if you were to even look at the prior year, you're seeing, you were seeing higher numbers of surplus the prior year. And the year before that, 21-22, it's similar to what we're in now. So I think comfortably, if you were to take another 12 students, if that's what you um, wanted to do. Um, I, like other administrators, don't advocate to lose an administrator in lieu of other positions. So I think comfortably you could reduce the proposed number for resource. Thanks, Jane. Uh, my concern with with this proposal would be uh, 
to echo a, a thought that was made last week. Um, these are short-term Band-Aid fixes uh, to get us below the default. This will now increase. Uh, instead of $163,000, it will now go up to $273,000 that will be included for next year's budget that is not currently included in next year's budget. So again, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Any other discussion on the MAD before we vote? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Um, so what's on the table right now is to bring back, uh, I have it in front of me. Ah, thank you. Bring back three custodial positions at $110,000. And what we would be doing to replace that is reduce the resource special education at Pinkerton by, by 12 students which is at a total of 111,456, which is slightly above what we're adding back. So I will ask Jason, would you start us off here? Yes. Katie? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Wilbur? Yes. Michael? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Chair, chair votes no. That's motion passes five to two. Motion to move forward with the proposed changes on, and I don't know what the net number is. I don't know. I don't know what the motion needs to be, unfortunately. But Jane, can you run? Can you just do the quick math on, on the change that we just made? So you're taking out 110,000, and I mean, excuse me, you're adding back 110,000, and then you're, I guess, and then 111, 456. Whatever the difference between those two numbers are, where we are today is the difference in what we'll be voting on. Basically, I think you're adding the 456, uh, excuse me, 1456, 14. um, and you're tacking it on to the bottom line number. Can you just do the quick math on that for me? So you'd be reducing the bottom line number by 1456. Reducing. Jane, I got nine six seven zero six nine as a total reductions. Nine six seven zero six nine. I don't know if that's a hundred percent accurate though. Nine six seven zero six nine. That was based off of the the so current proposed reductions of nine sixty eight five twenty five, and then I subtracted out the fourteen and changed. But just a point of clarity, I think that we're actually saving more money. So instead of it, so it was at nine nine sixty eight five twenty five reduction, right? So now we're reducing nine sixty nine nine eighty one. Nine eight one. So yeah, sorry. I, I, I was just trying to do the math. But. We need to bring I the will, athletes from DVS back. I'll move to reduce the proposed budget, $969,981, to get under default. Second. All right, we got a first by Jonathan, second by Jason. Any discussion before we vote? <coughs> Seeing none. Jason. Yes. Katie. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Wilbert. Yes. Michael. Yes. Brenda. The chair vote yes. Motion passes 7 0. Before, before, we move on, before we move on, I just have something quickly I want to I wanna say. 
Um, so it was mentioned during delegation of individuals. Um, during our budget process, Jane had outlined pretty clearly what the savings were by closing DVS in great detail. And during that budget discussion, we talked about what we would reinvest and what we would not reinvest. And I think the reinvestment number was $1.5 million. And just for a clear, just so everyone here knows, that $110,000 was part of the reinvestment into, into um, the district to bring those custodians back to do jobs like painting, grounds, stuff that just needs to be done more regularly, more and more consistently. So the one thing I would like to say is, you know, March 26, we picked a direction to move forward regarding the restructuring and the school closure. Today, we're finalizing the budget. So what I, what I would hope, and quite frankly, I, I think it's an expectation on all of us to, to move forward in a direction that we need to come together and figure out a way to make these two, two things successful. Um, and as a board, I think it's important that we show that to the public and work towards that. And not to say that we don't agree on everything, that's okay, but I think moving forward, it, it, needs, to be, it needs to be kind of more unity and more discussion on how we make this work in September, for when September comes along. So I hope, I hope we can do that, and um, I know we can, so I, I, I would greatly appreciate if we could kind of move, if we could move in that direction and, and work together. Because I know we all can, we all agree on capital improvements, we all can work together, we can start there and build on that. So um, that's all I really have to say, but uh, so let's, with that being said, I think Jane is gonna talk about our Honeywell. I'm sorry, but just to add to that, um, we should make it clear that after our vote, the town vote, this board did go against what the town wanted, so there's gonna be a lot of divide there. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I won't I won't go into a lengthy discussion. But you didn't hear me. what the town Excuse had me, to I say. Excuse me, I am talking. Um, so what I would say is, you know, three boards in the last three years that I've served on have voted that direction with seven different people, um, and each year we've we've gone down the same path to move forward. Um, I will say it again: from that vote, there was no fiscal impact on that question, which, as we know, a big deriving factor of those votes that day were taxes. That was a big factor. And when you vote to against the school budget and vote for petition number seven, that's, that's they don't jive. So, I w and it goes well beyond just the budget piece, it goes to deferred maintenance and the long-term viability of what we have to invest in the schools that are in the situation that they're in. So I, I'll leave it at that if, um, because we move forward. Um, next update is Honeywell, five-year cost no, avoidance no, report. No, 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 no. So while I agree that the Warren articles that were voted down had a large financial impact to the community, the renovations passed by the majority. They didn't pass by 60%. To me, and from what I've heard, it goes more to trust and credibility, and we took that away when we chose not to, not not to move forward with what the community voted on. That's huge. And when you talk about three boards voted, three boards never reached out to the town. We had to have citizens put a, t a petition together to reach out to the town to get what the community actually wanted, and we've again now this board has gone against what almost 2,000 voters said that they wanted. So there's definitely a divide there. Mr. Chair, can I add one yeah. thing? Yeah. Uh, one thing that we continue or is continued to be left out of the discussion is one thing, I, something I took away, obviously, there's a, there's a tax impact, right? And I think people are feeling the financial impact of inflation, et cetera. Um, to answer some of the questions around savings, the, we talked at length around what was being reinvested with the savings just on an operating cost. We cannot forget what is needed at Dairy Village in years one through three in terms of an immediate need for capital investment. Um, and then what is the long-term need for a full renovation if that building is going to stay, right? So years one through three, you're seven to $10 million long-term, 35 million. If you wanna call it 30, if you wanna call it 40, if you wanna call it 35, 
we don't we we didn't even get what we asked for 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 the the repairs of the other buildings we can't certainly add an additional building back into the number and expect that it's going to be okay i think what what we've said and some of those of us who have been in favor of this plan is what is the alternative how how do we move forward and, and keep all the schools open keep the tax rate low not have an impact invest the needed repairs into the schools renovate all the schools how do we do that that's my question and, and i I've asked people in the community, I, I, we've asked the board, if you're not in favor of it, that's fine, but what is the alternative solution? How do we get to where we need to be without any of those things happening? We didn't get a budget passed, we didn't get capital improvements passed, maybe take the new school out, that's fine. Town was obviously adamantly not in favor of a new building. How do we keep all of the schools open, make the, the repairs needed, make the long-term investments needed, and have a budget? How does it work? Please. Yes. Um, the nine you guys voted. Hello? Yep. So that nine, I went home and then I was thinking, I like, I feel like, I feel ashamed because like, uh, when you have a community voting on something and only four people decided to take it down, that's a huge decision. I think you guys don't have the power really to like uh, destroy like uh, everything the community has built. So I think uh, just four guys closing the school, he hurts, he hurts a lot. Because what's going on in Haiti right now, is just because the government, like only like five day people decide to close in school. So we don't know exactly what you guys have done to the community. I think you guys, you know, that's why I don't talk. Because it hurts when I see like uh, you guys closing school like that, just like uh, after like uh, the entire community, like uh, like it's in it's in hundred community, uh, it's in people in community voting like yes, they want the school the school like uh, stay open. And you guys say like uh, no, we don't want that. I think this is like uh, this is, should be like a shame for the board. I think we, we guys shouldn't look at the community on the eyes at all because I, I don't agree with that. My daughter went to DVS. No one here wants to close a school or close a building. Again, what is the alternative? What is the plan that is the opposite of the plan that the board put forward, that previous boards have voted on? What is the alternative solution? That is my question. We can't keep all of the buildings open. We, we didn't get a budget. We can't invest in the buildings. We have leaks coming in that my wife substitute taught yesterday at West Running Brook. And there's water coming down into a bucket. There's a hole in the floor. How do we do all this? I, we've talked about this so many times, but I'm curious, how do we do it all? We, there, there's been no, but the, here's the thing, Wilbert, there's been no alternative solution other than keep all the schools open. I don't wanna close a school. No one wants to close a school. This is the position that we're in. We haven't made investments in the schools. Enrollments are down. The, 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 the number of 1,000 was thrown about there. 1,000 is the number of students that were down in total enrollment over the last 20 years. There's 570 open desks. How do we do all this? I do agree with you. Please. Basically, all ears. We, we don't have the plan. We don't have a plan on the table to like uh, to bring. Uh, I mean, to bring like another strategy to work on the uh, on a plan to keep the school open. Just because you guys divide, we guys don't like each other. We guys say like, uh, this is my ego. I want to be. I, I want to win the debate. We guys spend more more energy and time debating on we, which part's gonna win. Like uh, fighting every day. Like uh, one day I came over here. Like you know what? I have to leave because that's what you guys offer to the community division. So I believe if you guys sit down together as like a school board members, we we'll probably come with a better plan to keep like our school open. We sit down together every two weeks. We, we've, talked about this. Now and now. we've talked about this now for over a year. A again, there's been no alternative really solution. Does, we down. can't just keep all of the buildings open and say, let's keep them all open. Look at what we just had to do. We spent a half hour reducing the, resource, the number of resource students again to find $110,000 so we could retain three custodians. You're talking about now keeping another building open that needs even minimum five million dollars over the next one to three years. Where does that five million dollars come from? I I would love to hear. It. We've been asking about it. Facilities committee. We've met every we met every two weeks last year. We talked about this throughout the last through, 
every two weeks we brought all of the the our information our discussions the meetings were open to people no one else has brought an alternative solution that that shows a path on how we can do this we're in a right now need to make a decision we've been in a right now need for probably the last several years may i ask you a question sure give me a plan that give me a strategy you guys work on to keep your school open Give me one. If you have a strategy that you guys are working on, like uh, everyone agree with it, and it, do, it didn't work out, then that I will agree. But you guys never spent, like, that's why it looks like to me, you guys never spent time working on a strategy to keep the school open. Give me one strategy you guys trying to work on it to keep the school open. If you give me one right now, I will agree with you. So I say shame on these previous boards that only focused their energy on building a new school and shutting down Dairy Village. Because with that, that's where all the energy was focused and you were doing a disservice to our community because that was what you were focusing on. That was the plan you were building, even though we had a community telling us that's not what we wanted. If we had taken that time and energy that we spent on that plan, we could have been putting that to a plan to keep our schools open in a different capacity. So Wilbert, to answer your question, um, when I was first elected back in 2022, we had a meeting. We had a meeting literally two weeks after the election, where Lavalley Brenziger came in. We had a workshop, a, a facilities workshop, and um, they they laid out that thousand-page report and they laid it out in terms of by building, where each building was at in the process or what they were they were. When I say look like in the process different f systems in, in the buildings. They, they went through each sim each one with us. And at that time, I mean, the numbers were staggering. And they, it, it you know, we've, we've talked about these numbers and these processes for over two years now. But this whole conversation really started that day. I mean, no, well, excuse me, it started when these guys, previous boards, you know, um, got Lavalley to do the work, then we, we discussed the, 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 um, the, the final product. And at that meeting, it, it was clear that it didn't make sense to, to invest that kind of money in two schools that, that we've talked about the last two years of 30, 35 million dollars to renovate. Or you could do the Band-Aid approach, which we agreed that that wasn't something that we would like, the road we'd like to go down. I, I guess what I, what I would say is, you know, for you know, longer than I've lived here, this discussions come up year over year over year, and I think previous boards have decided to to listen to the will of the people in those years, whatever. From and finally, we're at we're at today in a severe hole of deferred maintenance, whatever you want to call it. Pick your capital improvement needs, and if we if we do that again, we'll we'll be perpetuating a. a, a a problem that's been going on for for a while now and I think at this point in time it, it's time to move forward make a decision that moves the district forward and helps us fix the the problems that we have from a facilities perspective and and dig us out of the hole that we're currently in and you know I, I don't know that's just my perspective obviously from my two years on the board what I've kind of gleaned from everything I've been been working on but I just, I, I still, I, I have a problem when, when we couldn't put a fiscal impact on the, on the warrant that, I, I, like I said, I don't know what the vote would be, but I think it was imperative that we had that so people would know what they're actually voting for. I mean, th this is not a problem that developed yesterday. You know, this district has been talking about doing something about these buildings for at least a decade. It's a, been a known problem that these buildings are in need of huge investment. And there's been various reasons why nothing has really come to pass in 10 years, but I mean, many previous administrations have practically begged the school board to do something, anything, just do something. And there hasn't been a lot of progress over 10 years, and whether that's money or a lack of willpower to get something done, there hasn't really been much done. The work has continued to pile up at the schools, Enrollment has continued to decline. The idea that is currently in the works has been part of that discussion for 10 years. An intermediate school, a 7-8 middle school, closing, or, you know, a closing an elementary school, building a new elementary school, these are all ideas 
that have been talked about for years. So to say that this is an idea that has not been thought through or has come up with yesterday is just not an accurate representation of history. So I don't know the past, but what I, got, what I suggest you guys come together and then we need to, to work for the community because that's what we are for. We are here for. Uh, the students need us, the teachers need us, we need to work together. Because like uh, arguing every day, like uh, getting mad at each other, it doesn't work. It won't work for the community. I think like David say, I think we guys, we need to work together as board members, as brothers and sisters, and uh, like uh, separate leaders for the community. Thank you. At this point, are we, are we good in this discussion? I'm gonna move on to um, the Honeywell five-year cost avoidance. Okay, so we've included in your board packet the um, five-year um, performance contract or the five-year performance report for Honeywell and as people know, it is a performance contract where we had um, different equipment installed, HVAC equipment, and it was guaranteed to show cost savings. So every year, Honeywell is obligated to provide a written um, summary of the performance that we've attained over for year over year. And this report that's included in your packet is from October of 22, through September of 23. We received the report on December 22nd and we've um, tried to schedule it several times to have Honeywell come and present, but there have been um, other um, agenda items on the board packet, so we decided to finally put this in. And you know, unfortunately, I will just give a brief presentation, but I wanted to thank Justin Kopp, who's the measurement and verification specialist, as well as James uh, Lucy for putting this presentation together. Uh, the one that's actually, they're both on the website. One is 181 pages. So if you um, want to read all 181 pages, it's actually really good information. And it shows you detailed information of how the tracking is for all of our utilities that Honeywell did upgrades to to show what the cost savings or cost avoidance would have been. So I am going to flip through these pages, but these are just kind of a refresher of what the total project was, which was over 9.2 million. And our year three of guaranteed cost avoidance would have been 558,000. And I'm actually going to have Joe, again, this is all in your packet, so I'm not gonna go page by page. Jim Lucy would have uh, done a much better job than myself, but if we go to second to last page, which says year five cost avoidance by location. Let me just, thank you, Joe. All the way to the bottom of the presentation. You can keep going, keep going. Um, right there, the, the bar graph, there you go. So if you just wanna look at this summary page, the year five cost avoidance by location, this is gonna show you a summary of option A, which is the blue graph, and option C, which is the green graph. Option A is the electrical savings, and option C is the water savings. So if you look at the SAU office, there was a savings of 5,053. If you look at South Range, and total between electric and water, there was a savings of 92,192. And when I say real savings, these are cost avoidance. So had we not done the Honeywell project, these are costs that you would have actually seen in your budgeting. Um, Grinnell Elementary would have had cost avoidance of 61,646. Barca, 94,939. East Derry, $68,097. 
Derry Village, 56,263, West Running Brook, 112,635, and Gilbert H. Hood Middle School, 162,413, which I believe was a total of um, 653,238. And if we remember on the first slide, their guarantee was 558,000. So we actually had um, just about 100,000 more in cost avoidance than they had guaranteed us. So I think that that last page, if we just wanna look at um, the summary, I think that that's important data for you to know. And Honeywell themselves will actually, they will come next year and do their next year's presentation, which will be a, a same summary of one year of data. So if you have questions on them, please feel free to reach out to me. But otherwise, this presentation <laughs> is posted online. It's part of the board packet. And the 181-page report is also up on the board web, on the uh, website. Does anybody have any questions on the Honeywell? As a reminder, they are we contracted with them using ESSER funds to do additional HVAC work, and they are in our buildings um, working on that, those projects as we speak. Anybody have any questions on that? No? That was a good project that we did. Thank you, and years I guess ago. the town very much supported us on that project and has continued to. So thank you to them as well. Yeah, Jane, these numbers are great. Um, scanning through that report, um, you can see there's a lot of work that's been put in to the buildings from HVAC and energy efficiency. Um, so we appreciate all the work that goes into there. A um, couple things that stood out to me from that report. Um, one was the scheduling the controls. Um, I don't know exactly what the verbiage was, but it looks like um, we have some usage or we're, our, our schedules are set up where, you know, uh, there's nobody in the building, so um, hopefully we'll be seeing a plan for to rectify that because um, I know they mentioned it a few times. And then the other question I had was about the BERT devices. There's a mention of those not being used anymore. Um, if we could get some more information on that, I guess would be um, and would be nice to see as well. Those are the only two, but uh, you know, overall, um, you can see there's a lot of work that's been put in um, to make sure that we're you know, we've got windows sealed or doors sealed appropriately or whatever, the, the coils are being cleaned appropriately. So you can tell there's just definitely been a lot of work that's gone into making sure that we are exceeding the cost avoidance. So that's much appreciated. Um, I just would like to see how we're gonna continue to see those benefits um, in effect with the some of the things that they pointed out. Sure, and the, those BERT devices are, they're kind of like a little box that connect to copiers and things like that that track the utility usage. And unfortunately, I think when things get moved, they get misplaced or broken or, um, but the, the BERT program was supposed to, supposed to track all of those plug-in type of items. Um, so we will definitely be looking at making sure that those are all hooked up. Jane, they also made some of the copiers not work when they were first there. They had a lot of trouble with them. And I think now the new copy system that we have that Cliff put in, everybody has to have a code that goes in so there's an e easier way to track, I think, than with those boxes that worked sometimes and didn't work all the time and shorted things out. Yep. Thank you, Jane. Um, so let's go to facilities update. Who's running that? <coughs> that you, Joe, or Austin? Did I do it? So based on, so I'll address, actually I wanna address something. So we actually knew about West, we, we got a presentation on West Running Brook. I, I forget the date, but it's been out there for a while now, what we're, di what we're working with on West, West Running Brook. Um, this isn't something that just came up last meeting. Um, it's, it's just, we, find, we got the options of how to proceed. So one thing we need to really consider in facilities, whether it's all of us here today or at a future meeting is, how do we move forward? So we got one option was the netting, I guess, um, there's, I'm sure there's other options that are more cost effective that make more sense for one or two years. 
And the other thing is how do we figure out how to pay for it, right? So we get a $3 million problem. Um, I know you, Jane, Jane's business report looks like she's going to go over some numbers. That may be something we can talk about. But I think, and for Michael and Katie, if you want to add, for since we're on the facility committee, maybe after we get done with our discussion, maybe we need to figure out a date to meet and try to, and you guys bring what you guys think to the table of how do we, um, pay for it and move forward, or how do we defer it a year, or what the plan looks like for that. Um, so I'll leave it up to you guys to schedule the first meeting, if Michael and Katie are good with that. Um, you guys schedule the first meeting of the new board and the facilities, and, and I think coming to the table with options for West Running Brook should be priority number one, unless anybody else has any other priorities they want to bring up. I, I think at this point, we need to kind of make a decision and figure out short term then long term how we how we work with what with the um the banding issue um i think from a facilities perspective that's that's all i have to add before we move on can you mind if i ask a question so um with that in mind um i guess the big question is you know the netting is half a million dollars um, and is a temporary solution which will only prolong how how quickly we need to act, right? And it could be up there for two or three years, but that just means that while we're waiting, the costs of that $3 million is gonna continue to escalate as well at the same time. So we'd be putting a half million dollars in and then having to spend another three million, so that now becomes a three and a half million dollar um, challenge. So I guess my question, um, knowing that, you know, how difficult it is to get contractors is it feasible that we that that we have an opportunity to use the potential unspent funds that we have that we are accumulating and whether that's yeah i don't i, I just don't know how we would fil facilitate that but is that a possibility um and i guess could we do that within a, a time frame that is feasible um i think that's and again i don't know if that's an option that the facility committee looks at but I think it's um, yeah worth a discussion to find out what our op options are regarding that. So, because I would my preference would be not to invest five hundred thousand dollars and then invest three million, um, because that just adds a half a million dollars to the expenditure. But um, I don't know what other people's kind of uh, appetite is for that. Yeah, I mean, I had the same thought. You know, to spend half a million dollars on a mitigation measure for something that you're eventually going to have to fix, no matter what. Obviously, ideally, we would rather find the money to be able to just do that project instead of wasting half a million dollars. But yeah, that will come down to the matter of how can we find that money. I know uh, we had discussed this in a past facilities committee meeting: the idea of using unreserved funds to pay for this project, but there was a problem with that. Well, the problem with that is having, uh, having enough of those funds and also remembering that when we uh, did the budget prepar preparation for the 24-25, we used a $2 million potential revenue source of unreserved funds so if you do not have $2 million at the end of the year, you're going to affect the tax rate either way. So, um, and, I, and I am gonna go over the unreserved fund balance in my presentation uh, with my update. So, so you can, uh, Michael, you can use unreserved fund balance in this current fiscal year if you think you have enough money. You can use it in 24-25 if you want to use any remaining funds. Um, so both of those options can happen. The one, if you were going to use it next year, you would have to have a public hearing and all of that. If you were to do it this year using unspent funds, you would encumber the funds like we would any other project. So um, I don't feel confident at this point that we would be able to have 2.9 unspent funds and be able to use the two million dollar have two million dollars to go back to offset the tax rate next year and I don't feel comfortable telling you which RFP went out and how much it came back for which project because we've done nothing with it because it just came in 
But what I can tell you is we have hired experts, engineers, to design plans of projects. And this is not the um, building facade. But I just want to give you an example of the cost of things. So we hired engineers to look at a particular project. Their estimation was that project would likely cost, say, 200000 We have a mandatory walkthrough. Um, I believe one vendor did the man. Now, Tracy also calls vendors to personally invite people to please come bid. We had one vendor bid, and that estimate came in. I, again, don't hold me to this, because I haven't seen it. Tracy just related to me. It was in the $450,000 range. So even projects that, and this is a project that has to be done. So, and it's money that we'd be taking out of that 700,000, I believe, which now shrinks another project. So while even Gail is estimating 2.9, that was also, I don't know how many months ago, and it hasn't gone out to bid. That's just their estimate. So we also talked to Alan from Gail, I think when he was here, or, or earlier in the day when Alan was here presenting, we asked him, could you even do that project this late in the year? And they're not sure because we talked about doing granite as our banding, which was in the original design built for West Running Brook, and they went with brick. But going with granite, there is a pretty long lead time to get granite. So, um, you know, you could, the other estimate was going with brick again or going with the concrete that's there. And I think we all agreed that. We didn't feel comfortable with either of those options. And so I think even if we had, we'd have to have a lot of money left over if you didn't want to impact the tax rate for next year. So I hate to be so negative about it, but um, I, I think we're in that situation. So again, there's another project that we don't need, that's double what we anticipate it was going to be. I think, I know Jeremy had mentioned putting up fencing. Um, I would be in favor of fencing versus the half a million dollar netting. Uh, I, I would assume, depending upon the, the size of the square footage of the area, fencing would be significantly cheaper than spending a half a million dollars on a one, two, or three year Band-Aid um, just to keep the kids away or keep any danger at bay if need be. Yeah, and, and we're going to have Alan come back out again. And again, we've seen these problems of the last couple of years, but until you have an engineer come out and they take the concrete banding out, and Austin and I came up when they were doing that work and water was coming <coughs> out of there, then you see it. But, you know, having, if, if we're not, we have to invest in having engineers come out and do what they've been doing now is doing the due diligence and seeing problems that you can't, that regular maintenance is not going to be able to see and see the extent of the problem. So um, I know Jeremy is concerned about that project, so he will talk to Alan and see what he can do in the meantime. That's what worries me about all the projects that we have at all of these schools is every time you look closer at something, it costs multiple times more than anyone ever anticipated. So. So Jane, if, if I hear you right, I, I, get the, I get your initial point that we, we can't do both, give back the two million, the, whatever the number was, and do the project. But could we, if, if the board, if it was a will of the board to not give back the two million and figure out a way to pay for this project, was that an option on the table as well to consider? Yes, that would be on the table. It would be up to the board to- Do you have enough money, I guess I'm trying to say? Um, well, I'm gonna go through that in just I, see, a I think we do, I just, yes. okay. I think one other thing, and I know it, it's a kind of a long-term thing, but it, it may be worth in as part of facilities or as part of the full board to get a valuation on the Dairy Village property, just as an informational piece to understand what the value of the land is. Um, if we need to divest something, generate capital, generate dollars, not saying that that's the way the, the board would go, but um, obviously it takes, you know, the, the prime site for a new building down the road. But as we saw 
in the election just last month you know the appetite for a new school is not even close and that bit that it land you know would probably generate a decent amount of capital so i if the board would like me to do that i can ask dan scanlon to do another valuation he did sau and he did south range i believe it's in the range of a thousand dollars to do one of those and i'm just giving my opinion and i understand nobody wants to close dairy village we're not none of us really want to close it but um, it is the property that was chosen but i my personal opinion is we don't have any other land should the appetite of the town change to do that. But if the board would like me to get a evaluation, we're happy to do that. Where would that thousand dollars come from? It's not something that's budgeted, so we would just un underspend somewhere else. It's a bottom line budget, so we're able to do that. Should we maybe work closer with our strategic planning company before we start talking about selling off land for where our schools are? Yeah, your point's well taken. I, I think this is just a discussion to get some information to understand what it would take, I mean, excuse me, what it would be, wh what, what the land is worth so we have that bit of information to bring to the strategic committee, right? And then you, you guys can discuss what next steps are in the process. Um, but I think I think it's incumbent. If you know, I I would agree to, to do the assessment for a thousand dollars. But you know, I, I would take a motion for that if somebody's willing. But I'm just uh, that would be my my opinion on that. All right, well, um, I guess we'll continue to discuss that in facilities and bring some sort of um, plan to the, I mean, we'll talk about West Rhinebrook and, and the litany of things that we discussed tonight and, <coughs> and bring that to the board to talk about. So, so Sorry, I, I figured someone else. I, I will make a motion to spend $1,000 on doing the um, evaluation of, of Dairy Village property. Second. All right, we got a first by Jonathan, second by Jason. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Yeah. All right. Motion. As a chair, vote yes. Uh, just now, Jonathan, Jason, you spent a thousand dollars. That's every thousand dollars from that one. Right now. Okay. Motion passes five to two, and um, I would agree. Every thousand, every every bit of money matters. It definitely does. But um, I think when when Jane does her business administrator report, you'll understand that why we, we should be doing this. We've had the opportunity several times to look at selling the SAU, even though it's not probably worth as much as Dairy Village. We've chosen not to do that. We could move people into buildings. We've chosen not to do that. So this doesn't make sense to me before we do that with a building that is also in need of a lot of work. All right, uh, moving on, business administrator update. Okay, so this update's a little bit different. I did not include anything for food service, although um, good news, they're down to outstanding debt of $20,800. Um, and I think we are, I just put a lot of finances into this report. Sure, you can put that one up. So I've included the general fund revenues, update i've included expenditures by function code i've also included expenditures by object code and then i also included uh, some people had requested having line by line detail on the budget update so that's included as well so that you can see what the budget is what we have encumbered and for those who may not know what an encumbrance is it's you're basically, you have an expense and you're reserving the money. So for example, if we're buying books, we do a purchase order for books, just using a number. If you put in a purchase order for $100 for books, 
that becomes an encumbrance. After it's spent, it's no longer an encumbrance and it becomes um, part of the year-to-date expenditure. So as you look at any of those pages, um, it's gonna show you the budget, the year-to-date expenditure, how much is encumbered, and again, salaries are encumbered as well, and what the budget balance is. Now, if you have questions on individual lines, you can certainly reach, reach out to me and ask, because um, I may not know the answer just by looking at it, but um, there are, I don't know, probably 40 pages of detail on the budget, and this is all posted online, so if uh, people in the public want to look at it, what I would like to draw your attention to, which is going to be the, um, I'm actually going to just put up on the screen, if I scroll down, the unassigned fund balance page, which would be, yep. So again, if anybody has questions on the other ones, please feel free to reach out to me. What I wanted to do is show, there's a lot of questions that people have about unassigned fund balance, and people have said, um, it, I believe it came up at the last board meeting, someone I think had a comment that we have $4 million every year. That is not the case, but what an unreserved, what an unassigned fund balance is, it is a rolling number from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time when this district was established, you are, you have a, rolling number that goes from one year to the next. And that number is gonna change every year. So I tried to put, to show you just where it's starting from last year, and the total fund balance in the prior year was $7.2 million. And again, that was rolling because it included retained funds that we had set aside the prior year. And each year you're going to roll that number in and that becomes part of your um, number that you're working with each year. So in the prior year, we had 7.2, we had 89 million in revenues, we had $92 million in expenditures, <coughs> we had 190,000 in expend um, encumbrances from the prior year, so it almost looks like it's a revenue because you're bringing over um, the, because you've already retained it the prior year. And then we actually spent, we have um, 103,000 in encumbrances last year. So when you subtract out the fund balance and the 800,000 that we retained last year and the 1.8 that was on a Warren article that we used from retained funds, the total unassigned fund balance became 2,186,591. Now, that number, the 2,186, was used to reduce taxes in your tax bill in October. So, for 22-23, you see total unassigned fund balance was 2,186,000, because that's just used to offset taxes. You also have to include back in the 1.8 and the retained funds of 800,000. So your total Dave, fund, Can yeah. I just stop you for one second? Sure. Um, just for the um, benefit of people who may not understand what an encumbrance is, can you give an example of what that might be? Of an encumbrance? Yeah, Sure. thank you. So like the example of buying books, if, if Kim was buying books for the library for $100, and she has to do a purchase order, excuse me, she has to do a purchase order for $100 to Scholastic or somewhere. She does a purchase order for $100, and that encumbers the money. And what it tells me when I'm looking at our budget, tells me I have $100 less to spend out of our budget. It's set aside. And then once Kim's books come in, and we pay the bill for $100, it's no longer an encumbrance, it's now paid debt. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so it's actually, you're actually holding that money exactly. for a certain purchase, not whatever it is. It All is, of those <laughs> funds are just held for something that's been planned to be spent. Yes, so they are Thank only you. for planned expenditures that you actually have a purchase order for. And so that matters because as I get down to the end, it's gonna matter because there are things that are not encumbered. So if we look at the number that I'm gonna give you at the end. A lot of questions about it, so I sure, it yeah. Because at face value, if you were to just look, and so this is a little more detailed than probably anybody wants, but I, I try to do it so that people wanna follow along how I come up with my number. If you're looking at this current fiscal year, and I'm only using fund 10, which is our general fund, and in this case, I'm also, going, I'm also including the capital, res the capital reserve fund in here. So the revenues right now, whoops, Sorry. Right now the revenues were 80 million plus for the capital reserve account, which was that $700,000 that was on a Warren article last year, which was a raise and appropriate, which is just like, so you're basically asking taxpayers to raise funds to pay for that 700,000. So that's included in that 80 million. And then we are also anticipating receiving still $14,800,000. Million, $14 million now, that's supported by the first sheet that I believe was in my full budget report that's online to, because we're still anticipating receiving more um, appropriation money that we get from the town that's raised by local taxation. We're anticipating still receiving $14 million. Now, unanticipated funds of that, which I'm showing that as a reduction because you can't, if you were to choose to spend some of these unassigned funds on West Running Brook, you can't use unanticipated revenue, which is why I've subtracted that out of there. So now, will it be money at the end of the year that you can offset taxes with? Yes, but you can't spend it, okay, because it's unanticipated. And it kind of just cut its little self off. But that unanticipated revenue is partially because of uh, Laura getting so much in special ed aid, which was unanticipated, and interest earned that was unanticipated. So we're subtracting that out. And you also, we've recorded expenditures of 72 million, which you're subtracting out. You also want to subtract out that capital reserve account for 700 the 1.8 that was retained, and um, 90,000, 90, which are expenditures from the prior year, okay? And then when you look further down, right now I have 21 million, or as of the, when we did this on Friday, I have $21 million encumbered. Now what are those things? Those are things just like I talked about. They could be books. They are salaries, so anybody who has a letter of agreement or a contract, their salary is encumbered through the entire year. And what that does in the system is, I'm always able to track where we are on salaries and benefits and how much money it's going to cost to get us through the year. So all of those things are encumbered. What's not encumbered, though, is the retirement incentive that we know we're going to pay out at the end of June for those people who have given 20 or more years of service with our district and they're entitled by contract to a retirement incentive. Now, we budget $300,000 for that. Currently, we are looking at 422,000. So 300 was budgeted, this is actually an increased cost of unbudgeted expense of 122,000 more than we budgeted. But I'm subtracting it out for you because it's not part of an encumbrance, so I need to take that off there so that you don't think that there's another 422,000 to spend. So then your total fund balance becomes 3,474,000, and I am taking off, I, I wanted to separate that 800,000 because that's what you retained from the prior year. Now remember, the last couple years we've been retaining like 
Last year, the board voted to, because you voted for that 1.8, to take from unspent funds at the end of the year, it left us with the 2.1 plus that 800,000, which was the total, and of that, so I think it was like 2.9, the board said, we'll retain 800, the remaining will go to offset taxes. So we keep 800, we offset taxes with 2.1. So like I said, it's a rolling number. So each year your retained funds is going to be added back into what you have left over at the end of the year. So I have 800,000 from last year that we have available. But I wanted to separate it out so that you can see 800 was from last year. We have unspent 2.6 currently in this budget. But what I also want to point out is if we would end, if tomorrow was June 30th, sure, you can feel comfortable with that number. It's not to say that we've got April, May, June. It's not to say that, and this doesn't pick on Laura's department, but she knows it's true. You could have two move-ins that are outplaced for 200,000. You could have somebody that's currently in our district that needs to get outplaced. We um, also, I don't encumber substitute sa um, costs that we have every pay period because there's no way to encumber them because you don't know who's going to be doing that job. So this is just a snapshot and it's actually, this snapshot's from Friday. We ran checks today. So I'm always gonna be a, a week off even when I run this for you. So now while most things that we do in the district have encumbrances attached to them, because I require a purchase order for everything, every expense, so I know how much money we have. And it's also, I'm able to track payroll. But there are things that come up, and I will just give you an example today, of purchase orders that were opened just today for things that weren't anticipated. Um, and I, I don't have my system pulled up, but I'm gonna do it from memory. There was one for the um, elevator company for re emergency repair work at West Running Brook, I think it was between 4,500 uh, 4, and 4,700. That came in today, it's not included. Uh, they had to call the um, septic router man to unclog lines over at the deep. That was $900. Um, there, were, there was also to do the abatements at Gilbert H. Hood, $20,000. Those are things that just came in today. So would I like to be confident and say, nope, those are the expenses and that's what's gonna get us through the year? That's not the case. We still are gonna be buying more copy paper. I know there's things, there's line items in there for safety that we're gonna be buying some safety things. There's normal expenses that schools have not put in purchase orders for because they don't know what they're going to be yet. So um, that's why I try to be really conservative with my numbers. But I hope that that kind of makes sense to people where we're at. So if yes, if you want to add the 2.6 and the 800, right now your fund balance would be 3.4. Again, be very conservative when you're looking at that number. Does that make sense to everybody? So please, um, I hope everybody understands that we don't have unspent funds of $4 million every year. Those are years that are kind of been flukes because we've received rebates from Health Trust of almost 900,000. We've had years where Primex was, um, they had rebate years or years where we didn't have to pay for certain parts of their programming. Same thing for Health Trust. So there were years that yes, we had more money than we normally do in the course of a year. And again, those Pinkerton's numbers will fluctuate this as well. So, um, but I did wanna give you the most up-to-date numbers that I have. Again, this is from Friday and doesn't, is not inclusive of what we generated today. So no one's gonna feel good about that number because I don't see confidently how we can do the outside of the building. However, um, that's where we are right now. And of, if you were to look at that 3.4 right now, again, we had two million that we estimated for revenue next year in unreserved fund balance. 
So if you look at that, you could say, well, we would still have, if we were to give back the two million, we'd still have 1.4 million left to play with to do a maintenance project. So I don't think that it gets, <laughs> the projection does not get any better next year, and I'll tell you why, because of this, health insurance came in a lot lower last year with the GMR, and I think that that's why we took the gamble to go to 18%. Next year, there will be no surplus from health trust because next year's, what we budgeted is what it's coming in at. And usually we see quite a bit of savings from health insurance in order to have some of those unreserved fund balances, not purposefully. I don't want people to think that we budget that way to have surplus, but you're going to have, if I'm just looking at our numbers, sorry, trying to find it real quick. But if you look at where we didn't spend our money this year, unfilled positions, so hopefully those positions are filled next year, unfilled positions, and when you look at one of these charts that I do for unfilled positions, people like speech paths where you can't find them. Laura is overspending in contracted service providers. So kids are still getting speech services. It's just not coming out of salary. So salary is going to show a surplus. Contracted service is going to show way over. So don't panic when you see contracted services. You also have Pinkerton where we had surplus of um, between NECC next and out of district and Pinkerton, it was a $909,000. So, and where you went over this year, you can see that we went over on uh, transportation. We went over on, keeps bleeping out, so I'm just gonna do it off my head. We're over on transportation. We're over in other areas that, you know, reduce how much you're going to have. But next year will even be tighter because we don't have that health insurance surplus. Um, I'm hoping that all positions are filled. And, um, and of course, that correlates with your surplus and benefits. So when people are looking through all those financial reports that I put together, please don't judge that there is like 1.7 in unspent salaries because it's over in contracted services. It's just where it hit in the budget. They're just not employees at this time. So um, that's where we are on finance. Jane, thank you for providing that extra detail and going through that really comprehensive explanation. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Can you um, talk about the 20000 for abatement at Hood? What is that? Sure. So any of the schools that were built in a certain time period are going to likely have um, asbestos. And it's a mandated requirement that if you're going to lift any flooring that potentially could have it, you have to do an abatement. So it's a expensive but required um, expense and a project to do in any of our schools that are um, with, so anytime we're going to replace carpeting, put in flooring, we do abatements in there. So right now we have, I think it's three or four um, rooms at Hood that they're going to be, I think they, they're old, Joe, are they old science rooms? They're old science rooms that taking the cabinetry off, taking the plumbing out, all of that, and taking the flooring out and all of that requires an abatement. So it's something that we do every year in all of our schools if we want to do projects. So it's just very, very costly. And whether we did that now or waited, I've, you've seen some of those rooms at Gilbert H. Hood, the cabinetry is embarrassing that it's been there for so long. And whether we were doing this new plan or not, those rooms really needed to be done. So, but I'm just letting you know that, that that's a cost that came up. They were waiting to get pricing on, on doing that. So that's why it wasn't encumbered, and it's encumbered today. So this is related to renovations for 78? It's related to renovations for seven. 
<coughs> excuse me, for seven, eight, but because those rooms are currently empty, we would have been doing them anyways because there are no students using the room. So we try to pick rooms that either A, are empty so that we can get them done, so no, since nobody's in the school. And same thing, if we have to do flooring, it's on an emergency basis, or we know that room's not gonna be used, that way that room gets taken care of. So yes, it's part of it, but we would have done it anyways because even if they weren't using it for the transition of 7-8, somebody likely would be using that room next year for something and it really needed to be done, unfortunately. You know. So one of the things, so the thing I, I see based on what James basically updated us on is we have to, as a board, think about it individually how to proceed when the time comes is do we do short-term fencing for West Running Brook and wait to see how capital improvements uh, helps us next year in, in, the, in the process? Or we deplete the fund balance and not be able to offset the taxes that we put aside in the budget? So those are kind of two, unless I've missed an option, those are kind of the two options that are on the table that have to be kind of worked through. And I, I, would, I would ask the board members to think about that for the future when we when we bring it back from facilities and um, hopefully when when we meet in facilities austin jane and those guys can um present us with some sort of options to bring to the board but keep in mind i don't know if there's any other I, those are my two options i see if there's something else i'd be more than happy to hear it but those those looks like with what's in front of us right now sure so those those are the two options that are there right now every week i analyze our budget and where we are and what expenses and where we think um, you know we can necessarily cut back um, so as we get closer to the end of the year again that RFP that that went out I certainly don't want a contract to think well they're the only one that bids so um, so that's why I'm not saying what project it was for but somewhere that project's going to have to be done and that's that's got to come somewhere. So whether that comes out of unspent funds of this year, that remains to be seen. And that, that will come to the board. So we would make sure that we bring it. And we also reserve the right to not accept a bid if we, there's no competition. But. Any other questions before we move on? All right, um, so we got Kim Kim talking about federal assurances. Hello, okay. So in order to receive federal funding, um, we have to abide by a certain amount of assurances. Assurances are just um, district commitments that we adhere to. Um, they are legal, a legal binding document that has guidelines that are established by the federal government. Um, and because of that, I had to meet with um, the superintendent and the board chair. They have to um, sign off on those assurances, um, make sure that we have all the policies in place uh, so that we can receive all of our federal funds. So you need us to do a vote, right? Is there any, that's what it says in the uh, management report? Yes. Okay. Um, I, any questions we have for uh, Kim? I assume you will have questions <laughs> since we have to vote on this. So just, so just, I should probably say, Kim and I met today if I, uh, before our non-public and she walked me through all the, in Austin as well prior, walked us through all the um what's in this 30 page document based on you know federal guide uh excuse me new hampshire department of education guidelines and federal guidelines obviously um it, it was pretty straightforward and I, I didn't see any issues with it i know jonathan did this last year so um but obviously if you have any questions for kim let's let's hash it out now before we vote <laughs> I guess I would make a motion to accept the federal assurances. First by Jonathan. Second. Second by Jason. Any discussion? 
I think it's hard to ask questions if you haven't seen them and understand what's there. I mean, I, I know from previous years, but we have some new people who probably don't, and they, maybe they want to see the document that you have at least before we vote. Yeah. I'm not going to speak for them, but I'm just making the suggestion. No, that's a fair point. Kim, when does this have to be approved by and submitted? We don't have a, um, another meeting for another few weeks. So um, in order to move on any of our grant money for next year, in order for us to meet, de for me to meet the deadlines, um, I need to have these uploaded onto the GMS website. Also, the chair, the, the chair can also, by signing off, the chair can represent the board for these. Kim, why don't you, Kim, why don't you go through the, the, very, the high level points that are germane, that are important for everyone to understand, and um, I think we'll go that route. I mean, like you walked me through some particular items that were of, of greater importance than others, so why don't you take a minute and go through that, and hopefully, We'll have people at the comfort level that they're okay to vote tonight on this. So these are <clears throat> these are just mandated things. We are these are not from us, but these are that one. Um, <clears throat> this is just the signed copy. Um, that these are just from the federal government that we are um, uh, uh, making sure. So just the general assurances um, is just any federal funds that we that we get, we have to abide by a fiscal, the fiscal management of it. We have to make sure there's a procurement process um, for anything over a specific amount of money. Every single amount of money is different per every grant. Um, the we just have to make sure we have written written policies in place. Some of the written policies that we have to make sure is that um, we have updated our you know drug-free workplace, our procurement process, um, an inventory process, so that we have anything that's over you know equipment or anything that is federally funded that's spent. We have to make sure we have updated um, things. We have to have a um, allowable cost. Uh, policy, so we went through and updated all of the policies that we had. We just updated on the sheet. Um, any audits, we have to make sure that we, um, if we have a finding, we have to submit that back to the New Hampshire DOE um, for compliance purposes. And we have to have, what else should I? There's, um, those are the big things. Just the retention of our records, to make sure that we have our retention of our records in order. Um. I'm passing it down so the board members can kind of skim okay. through it and see if they have any questions. Were we doing all of the, like we had everything in place for all those requirements? Yes. Okay. Myself and Jane are very on top of this. <laughs> Is there anything new that they're requiring from years past? Just the um, updated, there was a chart of updated policies that we had to have, um, that we had to write in, that we had those policies and what they were. That was the only thing really new. And the other thing that was new is if we have a compliance issue that we have to um, send it to the compliance office, which is different from before. And just so I'm, we're clear, the, we, you have yearly audits on this, Jane, don't you? Like, multiple, you, you talk about all the audits you do. I'm assuming there's like five different audits that you deal with on a yearly basis that if we were to have findings, we would know about it. She, um, she'll get, she gets the fiscal audits and then, um, and then ha some of these are for the uh, program audits as well. So it's both. Any questions for Kim? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so there's a motion on the table. I think Jonathan first, uh, Jason seconded it. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? 
All right, motion passes seven. The chair votes yes. Motion passes seven zero. All right, Austin, let's uh, personnel's up. Thank you. So the first thing I want to say is just, again, in the realm of personnel, um, we have our people that um, do their thing. Um, when you think of what uh, almost a quarter century that uh, Jane has been doing, her business administrator, which is why she understands this thing back, backwards and forwards um, much better than I, and I rely on her. Uh, same thing with the federal grants. Kim's been doing this for a number of years and has a lot of expertise. She has a good way of explaining it to those of us that don't do it all the time. And um, they do a uh, wonderful job, and there's so many of them that do that. We do have somebody who has done a wonderful job for us um, but is resigning, did get a position in the Hudson School District, and they are going to um, be very pleased uh, to have Jeanette LaGrasse. Um, she is currently the Pace ELA teacher at West Running Brook, and I would ask you to accept her resignation at the end of, for the end of this school year um, with regret. So moved. Second. First with, bite. Oops, sorry. With, um, again, with a lot of regret and yeah. much appreciation for all that's been done for our children by her. All right, so we have a first by Jonathan, a second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, motion passes 7 0. And I have nominations tonight. Um, first and foremost, the administrative nominations for 24-25, um, asking that you accept the nomination of our administrators for the, for the upcoming school year. So moved. First by Jason, second by Jonathan. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Opposed? All right, motion passes 7-0. And our professional staff, um, these are the members of the uh, uh, DEA Teachers Union, um, and I ask that you accept uh, the nomination um, of our professional staff for the 2024-2025 school year. So moved. First by Jason, second by Jonathan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion passes 7-0. I want to thank all of our staff members for everything they do and look forward to um, working with all of them again in this upcoming year. Thank you, Austin. So we're, now we're on to the second readings of policies. Yes, all of these policies are uh, second readings. We had the first reading two meetings ago. Um, we put them on hold for the last meeting. I'm bringing them up again. Um, what I will do is like I did with the second reading, we have a, um, about five uh, new policies and um, well, uh, five categories <laughs> we have about uh, uh, eight or nine actually but um, I'll give a little description ACN um, is a complete New Hampshire School Board Association policy with minor um, formatting changes for the Dairy Cooperative School District Dairy School Board those things this is the mer nursing mothers accommodation and it is a new policy and then um, I mentioned this uh, two meetings ago, we had an audit, I should say Jane Samad in the business department had an audit and um, they were looking for us to um, update and add some policies to the DAAF section. Uh, the first one, which is DAF, the only one that doesn't have a hyphen number, 
Um, this was a suggestion by the policy committee that we bring this one forward because it explains, it has all the legal references and explains uh, the DEAF policies that are to follow, which are DAF 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So the first one is that policy. The next new one is uh, DAF6, which is Inventory Management Equipment and Supplies Purchased with Federal Funds. All of these that I'm going to list in the DEAF category are complete New Hampshire School Board policies, again, with just our minor dairy formatting. Um, DA7, um, we have a policy that talks with travel reimbursement, but the auditors wanted this one updated or, or added to DAF7, tra travel reimbursement federal funds. And the final one that we uh, is new to DAF is subrecipient monitoring and management, and that's DAF 11. Next policy is DFG, next new policy, DAFGA, which is crowdfunding. Um, and once again, it is a complete new New Hampshire School Board Association policy with minor formatting changes. Um, next is EBCC, false alarms, active shooter, bomb, and other, other such threats. Again, a new policy, complete New Hampshire School Board with minor formatting. And the last one, GADA, um, employment reference and verification. Um, once again, that is a completely new New Hampshire School Board policy with minor formatting changes. So I would like to move forward the uh, ASCN, DAF, DAF6, DAF7, DAF11, DFGA, EBCC, and GADA, all new policies for vote. So moved. First by Michael. Second. Second by Jason. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes 7-0. Okay, the next policies are updates. Um, I'm still a little, uh, uh, not completely sure why they like to have, sometimes I think it's just the sections, they wanna make sure that they're in two different sections because of what they, sometimes they'll pertain to students and other times also to staff. But this first one um, you'll see uh, is uh, drug and alcohol free workplace and schools, which is the same title. Uh, the first one is ADB um, slash GBEC, and then it's the exact same policy, GBEC slash ADB. Um, and that was updated um, to the New Hampshire School Board Association policy with minor formatting. Next policy is data records retention, which is EHB. Um, that was updated once again to the New Hampshire School Board Association policy with minor formatting changes and the um, local records retention schedule, that is our um, retention schedule that we took from New Hampshire School Board Association, that's what we go by. Again, minor formatting updates, that is EHB-R. Next is JKAA, which is use of restraints and seclusion. And we updated our policy to the New Hampshire School Board Association policy, again, with minor formatting changes. Um, then we go back to the audit uh, that Jane had and um, the DAF, uh, all of these policies we had and Honestly, <laughs> we uh, basically just did some minor formatting changes uh, because that way we, can, we could have the policy committee take a look at them, see if there was any need for anything specific, and put a um, current date on these uh, because the auditors wanted us to update uh, these and show that we looked at them which is what we did with DAF 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, and 10. 
Next is DKC, and I can get through the DAFs. This is that other policy that I indicated. It's the new DAF-7, um, and um, we already had this policy, policy of DKC, but since the auditors wanted us to uh, add the DAF-7, we updated uh, DKC um, with some minor formatting changes, expense and travel reimbursement. And then we go to um, EHAB. This is data governance and security. Now, this one we use New Hampshire School Board updates. The only thing is in the second paragraph where you see um, capital letter A definitions. In the third line right in the middle, uh, they just had us add where it says personally identifiable information, parentheses, I dot, E dot, P, I, I. That was the only addition there. And then there was an addition on, if you go to B, um, B1, um, there is an addition on the um, top of the second page where it says F. That's an addition from the New Hampshire School Board Association to this policy. And then an addition to the second paragraph in G, which is on right about the middle of the third page. Um, that was a uh, addition that the new law put in, uh, the paragraph that starts with notwithstanding. And those were the only updates to EHEB. Um, background investigation and criminal records history check, GBCD. Minor formatting changes, and if you look at uh, the volunteers section, which is up the top, um, the second paragraph that starts with no person. Um, that was the thing that they were stressing with this one. Um, no person whose credential issued by the New Hampshire Ed Department has been revoked or is under current suspension may serve as a volunteer for any service, et cetera. Um, so that was the addition to GBCD. Next is JCA, change of school assignment, best interest, and manifest educational hardship. Um, minor formatting changes, and we added two paragraphs. If you go to section B, um, six, which is um, uh, section B6 and B7, it's on the back page. Um, B6 is transportation, B7 is the annual review. Um, those two paragraphs were added um, by the new law, and we just had to update this. Anytime we do updates like this, we always go through and make sure our formatting is all corrected and all that, but basically it was just the addition of, the, of B6 and B7. And then uh, KCD, public gifts and donations, um, along with the mining, minor formatting changes, um, we uh, went to the New Hampshire School Board Association updates. Um, I call them monetary updates. And if you look at uh, the one, two, three, the third, uh, the fourth paragraph, it starts with the superintendent may accept. It initially was $500. That's been raised to $2,500. And um, when you see in the third line the $20,000 figure, that was $5,000. It's now been uh, raised up to $20,000. And um, we also added the last two paragraphs from the New Hampshire School Board um, Association, which is on the back page, uh, the voluntary contributions and active solicitation of gifts. <coughs> Excuse me, and finally, um, KI, uh, this was our policy, KI-AA, 
It's the only policy that I know of that we had that had two A's in it. I don't know what that was for, but New Hampshire School Board Association visitors to school policy is KI. So the first thing we updated is we changed the, the uh, uh, catalog um, from KI-AA <coughs> to KI. We used the New Hampshire School Board Association language um, for the uh, most part, except I kept the bulleted format that we had in our uh, former policy because I thought it read better and the policy committee agreed. So now I would like to move forward our updated policies, um, ADB, GBEC, and GBEC, ADB, EHB, JKA, DAF, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, and 10, DKC, EHB, GBCD, JCA, KCD, and KI. First by Jason. Second. Second by Michael. All in favor? Aye. Oh, sorry. Um, discussion? I, yeah, no, I just ha I have, um, I actually have a correction in EHB. Oh, thank you. And I think we can do, we can still vote on it because it's just yes. kind of a grammatical one, error. Um, EHB. 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 Yep. That's okay. Oh, it's wrong on that. EHB data records retention. Yes, so first it just says revised 2024. Can we add February in there? Oh, yes. And on the back, accident reports is listed twice. It's kind of a small thing, but no, I need to be on there twice. Thank you for catching that. You're welcome. Where is that? Right here. Oh. <laughs> well, there's a lot of accident A lot of accident reports. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... If it's okay with the uh, school board, we will remove that accident, that second accident report on the back, and we will add to the footnote um, revised February 2024. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. Good catch. You good? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, motion passes 7-0. All right, Austin, you're still up. Your report. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna read because I don't have time to open up my computer, so there. <laughs> um, all right, I'm, uh, I am beginning my superintendent report tonight by deferring some time to Kim Conant, Director of Curriculum and Grants. Ms. Conant has established a partnership with NWEA, the Northwest Evaluation Association as part of fostering data cultures and promoting assessment literacy. What she has done is to build a collaborative effort to integrate the MAP, Measures of Academic Progress Growth Assessments, seamlessly into our educational framework. Kim has organized workshops and delivered staff professional development here in Derry specific to interpreting assessment data using and understanding growth metrics and developing and implementing targeted instructional strategies based on that assessment data. Kim was recognized by NWEA MAP Growth for her efforts in building internal capacity with both administrators and teachers through the creation of data protocols and building time for teachers to collaborate during our early release days. As a result of her efforts, Derry Cooperative School District has made substantial gains in student growth and achievement data, with some grade levels even showing growth into the 80th percentile. Because of that student growth and Kim's efforts establishing a culture of data-informed teaching and learning, Kim, as well as two principals, Melissa Lance of Grinnell and David Brown of Baca, were all asked to be guest speakers at a national conference in Denver, Colorado. Thank you to both Principal Lance and Principal Brown, as well as all of our exceptional school administrators and our um, teachers who are working with um, the NWEA assess MAP assessments. And of course, here is Director of Curriculum and Grants, Kim Conant. Thank you. So we um, have partnered up with MAP Growth so that we could um, 
the protocols that Joe and I are creating that we could share those out and we talked about it was really great we had um, six different districts that came here all administrators um, and to ask us what we're doing how we're building it we're still at the beginning stages of developing assessment literacy um, with everybody but we were talking about how we use data walls and how we um, looked at different protocols for growth and for achievement and how teachers are working really hard to target instruction um, through those early release days that they are looking at the data even though it's one point of data they're looking at that data and they are building interventions based off of that um, uh, a couple of schools have changed some of the ways that they're um, doing their interventions so that it's a little bit more targeted um, and they're looking at uh, different four to six weeks of growth um, and so they keep doing that so um, I just want to shout out to all of the teachers and the students because they are really working hard and even though we are going through this restructure we have not lost focus of our assessments and our data and our curriculum Thank you, Kim. Um, so um, there have been co public com comments that have sort of alluded to a lack of emphasis on learning by the Dairy Cooperative School District. And as you can see, this could not be further from the truth. Although we have needed to discuss facilities, may I say ad nauseum, <laughs> at these board meetings, I have consistently reminded all who would listen why we really are here and that the administration and our teachers have never wavered from making curriculum, instruction, assessment, and learning our priority and number one objective. This has led us to the gains in student achievement like, what you, or like you just heard about from Director of Curriculum and Grants, Kim Conant. So speaking of learning, um, I would like to give an update on kindergarten registration. This year we have emphasized that it is first come, first serve regarding availability of seats in neighborhood schools. We will have a seat for every dairy kindergarten student, but your child may go to an overflow school once the available seats in their neighborhood school are filled. This has prompted a large number of you to register early with almost 80% of the available seats, um, I believe as of today, um, currently filled. Uh, so please do not procrastinate if you have not registered your kindergarten student for the 2024-2025 school year. Please go to the SAU 10 website, click on the kindergarten registration link to sign up your child today. Uh, there's been some uh, conversation about the end of uh, the school year, so I want to give some dates of our last week of school uh, beginning on June 10th. As of right now, Monday, June 10th, um, will be the two eighth grade dances, one at West Running Brook, one at Gilbert H. Hood. Those usually happen the evening prior to the eighth grade students' last day of school and their promotion. Um, Tuesday, June 8th, will be that eighth grade last day. And at 3.30, the West Running Brook School promotion ceremony. And at 6 o'clock, the Gilbert H. Hood Middle School um, uh, promotion ceremony. Uh, both of those would, will be at the Hackler Gymnasium once again. The last day of school for this school year, that would be for the Dairy Early Education Program deep students, as well as our kindergarten through grade seven students will be Wednesday, June 12th. <coughs> On Thursday, June 13th, we will have a full day of transition activities for our staff members. All of our staff members will um, attend the school that they will be at um, next school year and we'll have a great deal of activities and um, events planned for that day. And then uh, the final two staff um, uh, um, days, uh, staff day one will be Friday, June 14th and um, the second uh, staff day will be Monday, June 17th, 
Those are days that we worked out with the DEA through impact bargaining for them to pack up all their supplies for those that are moving to different uh, rooms, to different uh, schools. Uh, that will happen on Friday, June 14th and Monday, June 17th. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Kim, for that update. It's great. Um, it's really, really impressive that, that we have representation at a national conference, so thank you. Appreciate it. Um, FYI, we have the enrollment report. I don't know if anyone has any questions for Austin on that. All right. If not, um, committees. We have the manifest. I move to accept the manifest. Uh, and a grand total of $4,118,526.56. That consists of general payroll of $3,041,900.24 and general expenses of $1,076,626.32. Second. First by Jonathan, second by Jason. All in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? All right. Motion passes 7-0. Um, obviously, we, we just started the committee process, so it sounds like um, we have a facilities item to discuss in the near future. So like I said, Austin, just let us know when, when you're ready, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll convene the new, new committee there. And, and um, I don't know if anybody else, I thought I did, was there a legislative date set? Not yet. Not yet. Still in, in okay. All right, so sounds like that's coming up though sometime in April for a legislative committee meeting, which is hopefully hopefully uh, productive. I mean, we had I remember we had great conversations last year, and it's just a matter of executing on those conversations at the end of the day. Um, all right, other business. Um, I, I just have to I just have want to say one thing, uh, a couple things actually before I so. I want to reiterate what I said earlier regarding the question that came up during delegations regarding the savings at Dairy Village. So, you know, during the budget process, Jane had, Jane had provided a detailed listing of what that looked like. It was around $2 million. And then when the budget process ended, I think we were up, we, we reinvested about $1.5 million. Uh, so what that means is we were over default because we reinvested money into our education, into our schools in the form of STEM positions, math special uh, interventionists, so kind of custodians, um, and, and I think nurses, guidance a nurse, a guidance counselor, there's a whole litany of things. And, and you know, we made that decision, you know, in good faith. And um, so to say that where the savings is, <laughs> it was in the budget. We reinvested it. So I know it's hard when people come to the process, come to meetings at different points in the process, and and things get lost in the shuffle, and, and we have to repeat it, and that's fine. But um, I think you know we've been upfront and very clear in that point, at least I have for almost two years now. Um, so, and then the, I forget what the second point was. Um, all right, it doesn't really matter. Does anyone else have anything that we want to discuss? So we have uh, our date, time, location set for goal setting workshop. That's what I was gonna, thank you for reminding me. So August 16th, 6 p.m. at the SAU, I believe. Um, August, April 16th, excuse me, next Tuesday. Um, just make sure that gets posted and um, and obviously people who want to come and watch, and they're more than welcome to, they just can't participate. But um, so that would be April 16th, next Tuesday, 6 p.m. at the SAU. And um, like I said, just make sure that gets posted. I just want to say congratulations to Olivia Zenga and Camelia Perry from West Runningbrook who participated in the American Legion uh, speech contest and were recognized um, with certificates of distinction. So good for them. They did a great job. Pretty impressive. I also wanted to congratulate. We had three of our students from Grinnell that went up to the Elementary Honors Choir at the Allstate Music Festival last Friday while everyone was enjoying their snow day. So uh, yeah, it was a, a great day for them. They were spent all day rehearsing five songs. They got to do a great performance at the end of the day. It was awesome. And uh, you know, this is something where uh, you know Mr. Bucciero at, at Grinnell nominated three kids, accompanied them up there for the day, and uh, they were the you know only Dairy School represented at the uh, Elementary Honors Choir. And uh, a couple of weeks ago too, uh, you know, another music event. We had the West Running Brook Band and Chorus, the Hood Jazz Band, up performing at the State House. They also did a fantastic job. So 
lot of good things going on in the district with our music programs. Austin, can you just confirm the scheduled eighth grade celebrations, please? Just confirm the date for that. Monday, um, June 10th, uh, will be the uh, two eighth grade dances in the evening. Um, uh, we're looking at seeing if we can switch our school board member t uh, uh, maybe to that Monday instead of that Tuesday, because uh, we were reminded that Tuesday the um, 11th is the promotion. So that's 3.30 West Running Brook at six o'clock Gilbert H. Hood. Um, I guess we could have a school board, a short school board meeting if we had to after the promotion, but I don't think that's a good <laughs> idea. So we will look at dates and so forth. No, Jonathan? Okay. And then the last day for every other student, deep kids all the way through through seventh grade is, is Wednesday, June 12th. Thank and you. it, you're welcome. Sorry, one last thing. <laughs> Uh, I just want to thank the administration for the amount of time and effort you put in the budget process and what you came up with for reductions. You know, a million dollars, you know, it's not something to sneeze at, and I, I appreciate it. And I think overall, you know, for, for a situation that we're in, a, a bad situation that we're in, you made it um, as, as least painful as possible, and, and I appreciate that. And um, I'm sure the other board members too as well. But. I just wanted to thank you again, and and um, I truly, truly mean it that I'd like to move forward and try to work together as Wilbert talked about, and see what we can do to to make this the most the best possible transition, capital improvement plans, and and whatnot, and what what else comes down the pike. So that's all I got. This was brought up a couple, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, a couple meetings ago, I'm not sure. But um, I personally think we need to, or it would be a good idea to um, figure out some language regarding the resolution uh, for um, <coughs> adequate funding. Um, and so I don't know if we finalize that next week during our goal budget, or sorry, our goal uh, meeting. Um, but I think that's something that, you know, hopefully by next meeting we have something that we can um, review and, um, yeah, hopefully bring to, so if nobody else will do that, I, I can do that. I, I'll be honest, I'm probably just gonna recycle the same language that is from um, like Chester or an, another town. Uh, the second is, um, I know at my the last meeting that I was the chair, uh, there was a suggestion to add an agenda item once a month for bills that are going through the Senate or the House um, and give an opportunity to our state delegates or, uh, or local delegates or state delegates uh, or federal delegates, whomever, want to come and speak on those things um, and give uh, give the board an opportunity to have um, open conversations. I think that's something worth looking at as uh, looking into as well. So those are the only other two pieces of other business that I have. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, if nothing else, I would accept a, mo accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. First by Jonathan. Second. Second by Jason, all in favor? All right, motion passes 7-0. Have a great night.